so Dr. Cho, we'll, we'll turn it over to you and you can start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. Let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, let's take a look. All right, can you see this? So hopefully this is okay. I typically like to uh, present in uh, editing mode so I can see the rest of the Zoom windows to see what's going on. Otherwise, the full screen, I have no idea. Uh, so I hope this is okay. Um, yeah, so I looked at the schedule. It looks like this is the only uh, quantum sensing talk of uh, the summer school. So I'll try to give you a little bit, a little flavor of uh, what are some of the applications of quantum sensing. And I do have to warn you that uh, my background is in physics. So if I uh, end up using jargon or other terms and whatever that uh, are not understandable, it's completely my fault. And please uh, go ahead and interrupt and ask questions at any time. Uh, the uh, outline uh, for my uh, lecture today is first, I'll give you an overview of uh, dark matter. So the title is quantum computers as dark matter detectors. Like how can we use them to sense dark matter? So first I'll tell you what dark matter is. Uh, and then I'll describe some of the old obsolete technology, uh, which is using quantum limited amplifiers to measure tiny forces. So this might sound like very new and fresh, but uh, at this point it's about 10 years old uh, and we've moved beyond that. Um, next I'll go on to what's the new technology, which is measuring those same tiny forces, whether it's from dark matter or from something else. Uh, with superconducting qubits. And uh, this is just a special case study. Uh, you can also measure them, these forces with qubits of other types, like tra trapped ions and, and things like that. Uh, but I'll just use this to illustrate. That's a topic of my own research. Uh, and then we'll look, I'll talk a little bit about uh, using these same qubits as ultra sensitive detectors of, of ionizing radiation. And then if there's time, uh, which I doubt, uh, I'll mention how we can use quantum computers to process the vast amounts of data that we expect to uh, uh, get from uh, arrays of quantum sensors. Okay, so that's the plan. And let's see if I can advance my slide. Okay, and if you're interested, here's uh, some related news articles uh, related to what I'm talking about. Uh, there is one that just came out in science, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. And then I wrote an article for Physics Today a couple of years ago. Okay, so dark matter, what is it? So it turns out that most of the matter in the universe is actually dark matter. By dark, I mean that it's not luminous. We cannot see it in our telescopes, which means it does, doesn't have electric charge. It doesn't interact with photons. And so it's really, it's not made of the usual stuff that we know about protons and electrons and neutrons. And the way we can infer that it exists is with our telescope's observations. So uh, uh, way back in, I believe, the 1930s, uh, people measured the, uh, the velocities of uh, stars as they orbit uh, the, the gravitational potential of a galaxy, of many galaxies. And they noticed they, they made a plot of the velocity of the stars as a function of the radius, the distance from the center of the galaxy. You would expect that for a central potential, if all the gravitational mass were in the center, then as you go farther and farther away from the center of the galaxy, the velocity should be smaller. So this is exactly the same thing as those uh, those games that you go that you see at the science museum, where you roll a coin down, uh, on a potential on a on a funnel, which forms a gravitational potential well. And as you go closer and closer to the center, it rolls faster and faster. Okay, but instead, the measured rotation curves, the measured velocities do not decrease as you go to larger radius, but actually keep on increasing, which means that in addition to the mass in the stars in the center of the galaxy, there's a lot of invisible mass out here that we don't see. In fact, most of the mass, 85% of the mass is invisible. And it's not the stuff that we're used to. Okay, so this was very, very puzzling and that led to predictions uh, that speculations that there could be a lot of dark matter. It's not made up of this usual stuff. And this was spectacularly, spectacularly confirmed with observations of the bullet cluster, which is a collision of two gigantic galaxy clusters. So the scale here is uh, 1 million light years. 
And what happened here was that you had two clusters that collided with each other. And the stuff that does interact electromagnetically, the protons and electrons and photons, uh, slammed into each other in the center and stopped and created a bunch of high energy X-rays that we see uh, in red here in this false color uh, illustration. Uh, but then if you look at the background galaxies, okay, uh, those, the shapes of those get distorted due to gravitational lensing as the photons pass through the gravitational potential wells of the mass distribution. And so from that, from the, from the lensing of the distortions of the background in this image, you can infer these, that most of the mass is actually contained in these blue regions. So this was a really nice uh, illustration that the stuff that we know and love, the protons, electrons, and photons stop and there's some other kind of mass, some other kind of particle that flies right through and does not collide. Okay, so we're at this point through these and many other uh, demonstrations, many other uh, experiments and observations, we're pretty sure uh, that dark matter exists and but we have no idea what it is. Okay, so from these observations, this is the energy budget of the present day universe. Okay, the stuff that we know about, the atoms, make up only 4% of the energy budget. So everything that we're made up, all of our technology is based on this 4% of the stuff in the universe. 23% is this dark matter. And this number is obtained through many, many observations, not just what I showed you. Uh, and then of course we have 73% is this mysterious dark potential energy and we have no idea what this is either. Okay. <laughs> And the only way that we can infer that any of this, that all of this other stuff exists is via the gravitational effects that I just previously described. Um, and so far we haven't been able to directly sense any of this stuff other than observing the gravitation. So we also know that uh, our quantum sensors that we're developing based on our uh, quantum technologies are far more sensitive than anything we've had in the past. So this becomes a prime target uh, for, for applying our, our new technologies. Okay, so it turns out that uh, quantum computers and other quantum sensing platforms are pretty much ideal for, for dark matter searches. Because if you think of one of these cryogenic systems, you operate them inside a cryostat, uh, which really uh, prov provides a good deal of shielding from external disturbances like electromagnetic waves in the lab, from heat, from light, uh, from sound, um, and, by, and by isolating these single quantum bits, we can maximize their coherence time and perform long uh, extended quantum computations. Okay, so we have like very, very, we have, we have these sensors, these devices that are very, very well isolated from the environment. But because these dark matter waves, these, this dark, these dark matter particles or waves do not interact electromagnetically, then they're not actually blocked by the metals or in your shield. Okay, by the electron gas and the metals in the shield, they pass right through, so you cannot shield against dark matter. And so this provides a very clean environment where you kind of rejected everything else that could be a background. And if you see a blip in your sensor, some kind of disturbance, it has to be something that passed right through your shielding. And one of the things might be is dark matter. So if your quantum computer crashes, uh, maybe you're going to win a Nobel prize for it. Okay, so dark matter could take the form of individual particles or it could take the form of classical waves, just like uh, the waves of water uh, in an ocean. Uh, and it turns out there's a natural uh, 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 boundary between those two at about 70 electron volts of mass. Okay, so it turns out that if you, uh, if you uh, make the momentum spread of a particle smaller and smaller, then just quantum mechanically due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the wave function of these particles uh, becomes larger and larger and these wave functions determine the mode volume. So it turns out that about, at about 70 electron volts, the, the mode volume of individual dark matter particles becomes so large uh, that if these particles were fermionic where you only are allowed to have uh, one fermion uh, per mode due to the Pauli exclusion principle, then you wouldn't be able to fit all of these dark matter particles within the size of the observed galaxies. Okay, so what we know that for low enough mass dark matters, which have low momentum, uh, these particles must be bosonic so that you can have many, many particles per mode volume. And it turns out that uh, as you go to very low masses, then rapidly you get macroscopic 
mode occupation number. So classical sine waves, these modes are, are oscillating as classical sine waves, macroscopic occupation number much, much larger than one. Uh, whereas if it's fermionic dark matter or if it's a uh, higher mass dark matter, then you can get away with having mode occupation uh, numbers much smaller than one. So in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on uh, waves of dark matter moving collectively uh, and impacting our detectors. And we're going to look into uh, what is the, uh, what happens when that happens. Okay, so just to uh, give you an idea of scales, if we're looking in uh, for dark matter waves of gigahertz frequency, then typically these mode volumes are at a, around 100 meters, okay, the size of a football stadium. So imagine a football stadium with coherently oscillating waves in it. And these waves slowly drift across your array of quantum sensors. And then uh, via the force that these waves exert on your quantum sensor, it's the same way that a water wave slamming into your body would exert some force. Uh, you would be able to determine uh, that the waves were present. Um, and I should mention that for typical uh, numbers that we look for in uh, the dark matter field, uh, these waves, again, they're 100, 100 meter coherence length and about 10 to the 22 uh, particles uh, acting collectively in these classical sine waves. Okay, so that maps things very nicely onto a, tract a tractable problem that we can analyze uh, in a very general uh, way. Sorry, okay, here we go. So just to, as a specific example, uh, we have this thing called axion dark matter, which is waves of a certain kind of, uh, of phase angle uh, that breaks uh, charge conjugation and parity symmetry. Uh, for condensed matter physicists, you might think about this as something that breaks time reversal symmetry. And indeed, uh, there's uh, the, the concept of a condensed matter axion in uh, what's called the topological magnetic insulator that people are trying to make. And that's also originally based on this uh, originally based on this kind of dark matter model. But the point is that this wave has an amplitude of about 10 to the minus 19 radians. Okay, and this is just kind of a funny way of saying that uh, the dark matter is extremely weakly interacting. And so you have to sense very, very small uh, angles in your, in your experiment, very small uh, phase delay angles in your experiment. Um, so as it, the, so it turns out there is this uh, coupling of this kind of dark matter wave, again, which I'm calling theta, uh, to two photons, uh, the electric field of one photon and the magnetic field of another photon. And so if you have this wave oscillating in the background, that allows you to upscatter one of these photons into the other photon mode. And in other words, you can rotate magnetic fields into electric fields. And that's going to be the phenomenology that we're looking for. Uh, this is really no, this is exactly the same thing as three wave mixing in an amplifier, for example. Okay, so a specific uh, example of how to do this is uh, this dark matter haloscope. So it's like uh, some kind of scope that you try to measure the galactic halo, the dark matter in the galactic halo. And the idea, is, as I said, there's a classical dark matter wave uh, which interacts with the magnetic field and up converts the magnetic field into radio frequency photons in a microwave cavity. Um, okay, so uh, there's some math here that we don't necessarily have to go into, but I'll just say the dark matter interacting with the magnetic field can be interpreted as a space filling current density, which you then just plug into uh, the Maxwell equations and that current density then just uh, sources the electric and magnetic fields in the same way that any other current electric current uh, would do so. And so you can think of this as there's a cavity mode uh, with photons bouncing back and forth between the two ends of the cavity. You have a magnetic field that's in the vertical direction and then you have the dark matter coming in. The dark matter is kind of like a, a, a for, uh, an oscill oscillatory periodic force that pushes this cavity mode uh, once per cycle. And the cavity mode, the photons in here, imagine a wave front starting from the left, uh, traversing to the right, bouncing off the far wall and coming back to the left. 
And if the size, if, we'll, if, the, if the transverse size of this, uh, uh, the distance between these two mirrored walls is exactly right, then when it comes back, the next crest of the dark matter wave arrives and gives it a push in phase. Okay, so the dark matter is swinging back and forth and the dark matter, sorry, the cavity mode, the photon is swinging back and forth and the dark matter is coming in and pushing it in phase if the cavity mode is exactly the right size. Okay, so in other words, you want to match the, th the length of the cavity to the half wavelength of the dark matter wave. And then you can get a coherent buildup of the photon wave over some coherence time and build up its amplitude to a point where it might be detectable uh, through your, uh, your various uh, uh, electronics. Okay, so I want to emphasize again that you only get this resonance scattering condition if the size of the scattering target is equal to one over the momentum transfer. So that's generally the condition for resonance scattering, whether you're talking about dark matter waves, like I'm talking like in today's lecture, or if you're talking about just a, a, a radio antenna that you would uh, put on your cell phone or on your, on, your, on your car radio or something, you always want to match the antenna size uh, to the uh, inverse momentum transfer. Um, so, uh, for example, gigahertz axions are well matched to 50 centimeter scale microwave cavities. So again, imagine the photon waves bouncing back and forth uh, between the opposite walls of this metallic cylinder. And if you have heavier dark matter, uh, uh, like 100 GeV dark matter, then uh, these are matched to the masses of atomic nuclei. The size of the atomic nuclei are equal to the one over their mass. And so again, uh, just like billiard ball scattering, you want to match the mass or the size of the scattering target to the momentum transfer that you get from bouncing something off of it. This is again, a very general uh, principle. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble advancing this slide. Uh, okay. Um, all right, so again, specializing to the uh, case of wave dark matter, uh, we're going to, uh, this is something I mocked up uh, for my kids at breakfast one day. Uh, what I've done is I've, create, I've taken a Newton's cradle, uh, which has two oscillators, two mechanical pendula in it, and I'm coupling the two of them with refrigerator magnets. And then this will illustrate uh, this coherence effect where if, uh, the, the, uh, the oscillation frequency of both oscillators is exactly the same, uh, then the pushes that one oscillator gives to the other oscillator, this time through the magnetic force, will always come in phase, uh, and you can build up the transfer of momentum uh, from one oscillator to the other. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start this oscillator going, I'm going to see what happens to this oscillator. So hopefully you can see this. You can see the pushes are always coming at exactly the right time to uh, tr coherently uh, transfer momentum from one oscillator to the other. And you can see the first one has almost lost all of its energy now and given it all to the second one. The first one's about to stop. Okay, so this is called the first mixing maximum where all of the amplitude has been transferred to the other oscillator. And now watch what happens. The other oscillator is now exerting force on the first oscillator. And again, because the lengths of these pendula are the same, they have exactly the same resonant frequency, the same oscillation frequency. And so the pushes always come at exactly the right time. Okay, great. All right, so if you plot the amplitude of one of the oscillators versus time through this process, what you'll see is that oscillator, um, so this is the oscillator that was, at, was still at the beginning. Uh, what you'll see is that it'll gradually, it'll oscillate at its resonant frequency, but the amplitude will gradually increase until it sucks up all of the energy from the oscillator. That's what we saw halfway through that previous video. Uh, and, but then if you wait longer uh, for these two coupled oscillators, eventually all of the energy uh, will migrate back to the original oscillator and the amplitude of this oscillator will go to zero. 
Uh, so this is great, uh, but uh, what happens is that uh, this will this phenomenon will only happen if there are no other losses in the system, and uh, uh, there's no other disturbances that uh, cause phase errors in one of the oscillators to randomize uh, the timing of its swings. And it turns out in a real life situation, uh, this this cavity photon coherence time or its lifetime is fairly short compared to the time it takes to transfer all of the energy from the dark matter uh, to this cavity oscillator. And so in fact, this process cuts off before, far before it reaches the mixing maximum. You never have a chance of uh, extracting all of that energy from the dark matter. It would be great if you could because there's a huge amount of energy out there. Uh, but unfortunately, the coherence times that we have today are nowhere close to what's needed. And so the signal will be tiny. So the amplitude of your receiving oscillator will only grow to a tiny size and it will never reach the, uh, the total amplitude of the dark matter wave. So by tiny, I mean really, really tiny. And to go, to go into that, I have to uh, do a little bit of electrical engineering now. So the electrical engineers in the audience will understand that typically we des describe a classical sine wave as a rotating phaser uh, where the, uh, the radius of this uh, arrow uh, describes the amplitude of the sine wave, uh, and then the phase of the sine wave is just the angle it makes with respect to the x-axis. There's typically two quadratures that you refer to, the x or position quadrature or the, and the p or momentum quadrature, and this is by analogy to, again, uh, a mechanical oscillator kid on a swing where when it reaches its maximum position excursion, all of its energy is stored into potential energy. And when it reaches the bottom of its swinging motion, it's at its maximum velocity and all of the energy is stored in momentum or kinetic energy. Okay, so these are the two phases of any oscillator. These are called the cosine and sine quadratures. So that's just some terminology of, of in this case, it's the electric field oscillation that we're interested in. And we know from quantum mechanics, uh, that these position and momentum observables, these operators do not commute with each other. And that's true uh, for position and momentum in real space, but it's also true for uh, the effective position and momentum, even describing these internal field quadratures, the cosine and sine components of, of, of uh, electromagnetic waves. And the way you can understand this is you have piezo transducers that can transduce mechanical motion into electrical signals and so whatever uncertainty principle, Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, effect uh, that applies to mechanical motions will also apply to internal electro, electro, electric motions. This is something that's not always made clear in introductory physics classes. Okay, so we're going to do some simulations now of, uh, of uh, of the motion of these oscillators. So this is now again, the two pendulum experiment. I have one pendulum on the left and one pendulum on the right. Uh, we're going to plot uh, the position, the endpoint, of the arrow at the end of those phasers that I just showed. And um, instead of being uh, the position of the endpoint of that arrow being absolutely known, absolutely, de absolutely determined, because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the um, uh, the uh, non-commutation of, uh, of the X and P operators that I showed. Uh, in quantum mechanics, we learn that this implies that uh, uh, the endpoint can only be known to within an, uh, an uncertainty of an area of one half H bar in this XP uh, phase space. So in, in other words, uncertainty in X times uncertainty in P is equal to one half H bar. And that's why uh, instead of just having a single point describing the end of that phaser, uh, we're going to have a Gaussian distribution uh, reflecting this uncertainty in the endpoint. Um, there's two things I want to mention about this. Uh, this delta x times delta p equal one half. That's a version of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that uh, applies in these Cartesian coordinates. But uh, the phasers are more naturally described in polar coordinates of, uh, of, ra of radius, like amplitude and phase. And amplitude is related to the photon occupation number. And so in polar coordinates, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle can be written as the uncertainty in photon occupation number in that sine wave, the number of photons in that sine wave, and the phase of that sine wave, uncertainty in the phase of the sine wave, uh, they have this uncertainty product such that they're also greater than one half. Okay, so there's a lot of confusion. This is called the photon number phase uncertainty relationship. 
but it's exactly the same thing as the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship, just written in polar coordinates. Okay, so again, I have one sine wave that's starting off at finite amplitude, uh, and the other oscillator, I'm going to start with zero amplitude, uh, and we're going to see what happens uh, when I couple the two of them and transfer uh, momentum from one to the other, exactly the same as the video I showed before, but now this time in simulation using these phasor diagrams. Let's see if I can play this. Oh boy, this is really slow. <laughs> are, are you guys able to see this or is it uh, hopeless? Oh, there we go. Okay, so you can see this one was originally at rest and was picking up uh, amplitude. The first one that's now at rest, that's the first mixing maximum. Now the first one is retrieving its energy from the second one. And the second one has stopped and the first one has all of this energy again. Okay, so again, due to this uh, effect of having a limited coherence time, that's much small, much smaller than this uh, mixing period that needed to reach that mixing maximum. The dark matter wave actually displaces this, the cavity vacuum state by a really tiny amount, and it turns out to be much smaller than the size of, that, of those Gaussian blobs that describe the zero point vacuum noise due to the uncertainty principle. Okay, so you start with the vacuum state of the receiving oscillator, that cavity mode, the cavity photon mode, and after the dark matter acts on it for over some coherence time. Uh, that that uh, the amplitude of that cavity mode gets shifted to some slightly larger value, but it's really hard to distinguish that uh, against the uh, uncertainty from the zero point noise. And it turns out you need to make this measurement uh, in the current experiments. It's so small, you need to make this measurement millions and millions of times to average away the zero point noise. So you can see uh, that there's a tiny non-zero amplitude uh, that, uh, that, this, uh, that this oscillator has, has acquired. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit now about amplifiers, which, uh, uh, okay, so I already mentioned before that this technology was really new and fresh, uh, but unfortunately, at least for dark matter, it's already obsolete. Uh, but the application uh, was prominently featured in this uh, 2018 National Strategic Overview for Quantum Information Science this uh, uh, White House report, which launched the National Quantum Initiative. And it was this particular device. Uh, it was a, a, meta, a, a, a transmission line made up of this Josephson meta material, where uh, instead of uh, just having some uh, inductance per unit length and some capacitance per unit length, uh, the inductance that was put in here was a nonlinear inductance coming from uh, uh, a series of Josephson junctions. So here there's actually 2000 Joseph's injunctions in this metamaterial. So it's a nonlinear transmission line. Uh, and then what you do is you have this nonlinear response. And so you send in a, a pump wave and you send in a signal wave. And through this nonlinearity, the pump wave mixes with the signal wave and transfers energy to that signal wave. And by the time you get out, you can get amplified output. And so this is kind of a, a general uh, paradigm for how you get amplification. There's usually some nonlinear element involved and you get the amplification just by beating uh, two waves together. Okay, so here's a diagram that in, again, fairly generically illustrates this phenomenon. So uh, this is uh, plotting versus energy. You have some energy scales involved. You come in with a pump wave uh, that uh, as at a frequency omega pump, and then you also send in a signal wave that is at frequency omega signal. And you would like to transfer energy from this pump wave to the signal wave to amplify it. Uh, but then if you think about this as a quantum phenomenon, uh, the energy in the, in the pump wave is quantized in units of uh, h bar omega pump. And if that's different from h bar omega signal, then you cannot conserve energy by, uh, 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 by taking, taking one photon out of the pump wave. Uh, and sending it into the signal wave because the frequencies are different, so the energies are different. So just by energy conservation, you can automatically infer that there has to be a third wave involved, so-called spectator wave or idler wave, uh, that is at the difference frequency between omega pump and omega signal, such that if you absorb a single or two photons at omega pump, uh, you're allowed to create 
uh, a single photon at omega signal and a single photon at omega idler, and the whole process conserves energy uh, photon by photon. Okay, so in this case, uh, the uh, the signal wave comes out, it's picked up an extra photon, but then you've also amplified uh, 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 the spectator photon mode. And through this mixing process, it turns out that the output that you get, because you have mixing of all these different waves, the output you get uh, contains some noise, which is not just the noise, the zero point noise, the quantum noise of your signal mode, but it also contains the zero point noise of the idler mode that you mixed in. Um, so you actually, for technical reasons, uh, when you work it all, all out, you get uh, not just a half photon of zero point noise from the signal mode, but you also get an extra half photon of noise from the idler mode. And this is called the standard quantum limit. That the noise variance of amplified output of the signal, uh, the zero point noise variance uh, is always uh, plus or minus one photon. And this is pretty much when you're doing a linear amplifier, this is pretty much the best you can do but I'll show you a, a slight variation of this in just a bit. Um, and again, just for comparison, most amplifiers that you are typic typically used to working with, for example, if you buy something from mini circuits, those are thermal noise dominated. The noise levels of those amplifiers will be far higher than uh, what we're talking about here. Okay, so the other thing you can think about doing is um, pumping uh, this kind of uh, amplifier, it's nonlinear amplifier, uh, with a pump that's exactly twice the signal frequency at which the signal fre the, the frequency of the signal mode and this frequency the frequency of this idler mode, the spectator mode, are exactly the same. So then we're really talking about the same mode, and there's no longer uh, two different modes involved, and there's no longer uh, two different contributions to the zero point noise. So in that case, that's called degenerate parametric amplification. And I could have gone through a lot of math, or again, we could go to back to the playground and use uh, swing physics. Uh, so you know that when you're on a swing, uh, when you uh, swing up, you kick your legs out. And when, you, when you're coming back, you kick your legs back in. So you're actually kicking your legs at twice the swing frequency. And that's exactly what's happening here. And it turns out if you kick at twice the swing frequency, if you, st if you start at rest, you start uh, building up. Uh, and you start getting really good uh, uh, amplitude in your swinging motion. Uh, but that critically depends on kicking again at exactly the right time. Okay, if you kick at the wrong time, like 90 degrees of phase uh, away, uh, away from when you're supposed to kick, then instead of building up amplitude, uh, you start slowing down. Okay, so in terms of this uh, quadrature picture, it turns out that if you do this, uh, one of the quadratures where you're kicking in phase uh, will become amplified, will, will pick up amplitude uh, from this power source you're, you're kicking, whereas the other one, the other quadrature, uh, will not be amplified and in fact will be shrunk. Okay, so here's a picture of something that started at zero point noise, and the in phase quadrature will get, will, will get amplified and its noise will get stretched out. Uh, nothing happens to the other quadrature. And whereas uh, if you have something up here, uh, uh, input zero point noise, uh, uh, where you've already started swinging, but you act, you've, you're accidentally kicking out of phase, then you actually extract energy uh, from that original swinging motion, and you gradually slow down and slow down and slow down until eventually you'll stop. So that means the amplitude gets reduced. Uh, but at the same time, you had noise in the in-phase quadrature, so the noise uh, gets, gets amplified. Okay, so through this, de this degenerate parametric amplification process, you can squeeze these phase space distributions. So that's the term that we use, it's called squeezing, uh, uh, and, and shape them into uh, shapes that are optimal for quantum sensing. Okay, so I want to emphasize then the resolution of, what, of any kind of probe to these displacement signals is pretty much just given by the phase space distribution. So the original case I showed was this unsqueezed noise and some force acts on this oscillator, displaces it to some finite non-zero amplitude. And the only way you can resolve that is if the amplitude is larger than the noise. But if you, if you can use this degenerate squeezing technique, the squeezing technique from degenerate parametric amplification, 
you can change the original phase space distribution of your probe oscillator such that if you have a displacement, uh, you have much better resolution now to the displacements in certain directions. So the in-phase displacement, you'll have really good resolution. The out-of-phase, 90-degree phase uh, displacement, uh, you won't be able to see so well. And this particular technology has been successfully deployed both in the LIGO gravitational wave detectors and also uh, axion detectors such as Haystack. So this is kind of the fresh and new thing, um, but we're going to see that it's about to become obsolete soon as well. Um, okay, so here's a picture of the ADMX experiment, one of these axion search experiments. The cavity is down here. You have to stick it inside a liquid helium cryostat uh, and then a dilution refrigerator after that to make it extra cold to get rid of all the thermal photons. Uh, they're, they're, uh, right now, these guys are extracting it out of a magnet that's buried in the floor here. So you have to apply that DC magnetic field. And again, dark matter waves come in and through uh, this three wave mixing process, this topological uh, magnetoelectric effect, it scatters the dark matter axions, upscatters them, uh, upscatter, the axions come in and upscatters the DC magnetic field of the RF photons. And you do try to detect it, uh, the, the power in these RF photons by uh, uh, putting a straw in there and, and uh, seeing how much, how, much, how much power leaks out. And so I don't need to go into this, but this is how, uh, this is kind of how the experiment works. Signal power levels just again give you a sense of scale of 10 to the minus 23 watts. Uh, and the signal power is far less than the power coming from the zero point noise. So it turns out you need to average, you need to integrate for 15, about 15 minutes uh, for each cavity tuning to average away this, the thermal noise power at 500 millikelvin. Okay, so this plot shows you why, uh, uh, why this matters. So this is the photon rate versus the photon frequency. The black line is the prediction from the dark matter signal. So it turns out as you go to higher and higher frequencies, again, you, you needed to make the um, size of this cavity such that uh, 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 it's matched to the, to, the, to the wavelength of the oscillations. Remember, as a photon wave moves back and forth, it has to come in time with the pushes from the dark matter wave. So as you go to higher and higher frequencies, the dark matter waves have much shorter wavelengths which means your detector sizes have to shrink and smaller detector sizes means you intercept less of the dark matter that's coming in. Okay, so the signal level, the signal photon rate is expected to plummet uh, from uh, thousands of photons per second down to uh, photons per hour, one photon per hour uh, as you go to higher and higher frequencies. Uh, but the second thing that happens as you go to higher and higher frequencies is you make the measurements far more rapidly and each time you make a measurement, you're resolving a single mode. When you resolve a single mode, you pick up the zero point noise of that mode. Uh, so it's always uh, plus or minus one photon in the zero point noise. But as you make measurements more and more rapidly, uh, the effective photon rate increases more or less linearly uh, with the frequency. And the current dark matter experiments are operating at about one gigahertz. So the noise level is not so different from the signal level. So you can get away with average, averaging the noise down. But as you go to higher and higher frequencies, this noise is many, many orders of magnitude higher than the signal level. And it would take pretty much the age of the universe to average this noise down. Okay, so that's what I mean. Uh, we have these standard quantum limited amplifiers uh, that were just so recently developed, uh, but they're almost immediately obsolete. The dark matter detection problem is extremely challenging. And so for the remaining, uh, Duration of this lecture, I'll talk about the, the newer technology. Okay, so we're going to be trying to measure these tiny forces with qubits instead of amplifiers. And it turns out qubits are far, far better. Okay, so remember when I said that uh, you can pretty much read off the sensitivity uh, uh, of a probe to these small displacements just by looking at its phase space distribution. And so it turns out uh, it's better to just use photon counting and use what's called the Fock basis, the number eigenstates of, these, uh, of the cavity oscillator mode. So number eigenstates have uh, completely uh, well-determined uh, occupation number. Number of photons could be zero, one, two, or three. And by this Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it means that if you have no 
uh, uncertainty in the photon number of a mode, then you have to have maximal uncertainty in the phase of the mode. So the phase space distribution of these uh, modes of definite photon number, again, the technical terminology is FOC modes, FOC states, uh, the phase space distribution are just these blue annuli. And so these blue annuli are have a very little spread in radius uh, and maximum uncertainty in the phase angle. Uh, but because they have such small uh, extent in radius, they become very, very good, uh, very, very precise probes of uh, whether the initial vacuum state has shifted away such that uh, part of it starts overlapping uh, with one of these uh, one of these Fox states. And the, uh, so the, the way the measurement goes is again, you prepare the cavity in the vacuum state, uh, and then you ask uh, after some time, uh, was there some force that acted on that cavity mode, displaced it, put a single photon into that mode, the mode is also with some tiny amplitude. Is there or not a single photon in that mode? And so then you ask, well, uh, I'm going to see, and then we do counting. And if the effect of when you do photon counting, uh, this is the effective uh, 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 distribution of the probe in phase space. Um, okay. And because we are not getting any information at all about the phase of the photon wave in the cavity, it turns out the Heisenberg uncertainty principle doesn't apply. Okay, the back action of the, of the measurement, the kick that you get to, to the system for making the measurement goes completely into the phase observable, which you weren't measuring anyway. So it turns out there's no Heisenberg uncertainty principle that applies. Uh, the measurement noise can be arbitrarily low. Uh, and uh, it turns out, I'll show you, it'll be far better than what we achieved with the quantum amplifiers. Okay, so the way that these uh, uh, measurements work. Uh, I'll, I'll try to illustrate that with uh, uh, an analogy to the index of refraction. So these are atomic sensors. Uh, and so typically, if you think of sending a photon from the left to the right through some dielectric material that contains a lot of atoms and a lot of resonances, uh, then what you'll find is that the photons will slow down and there's an index of refraction effect. So the photons will slow down as they pass through. Uh, but then you can rework this diagram. What happens if you just take an atom out of the material and send it flying from the left to the right through a bath of photons, then it turns out uh, uh, through exactly the same interactions, these atoms, if you use them as atomic clocks, uh, their clock frequency will also slow down as they interact with uh, these background photons. Okay, so it's a little bit wild, but it's true. Um, the other thing that happens is that if you're, if you're sending the photons through this dielectric medium and you're unlucky enough to be sending it through a resonance of that medium, then those photons will be absorbed. But if you're far off any of the absorption resonances, then the photons will fly right through without very much loss. Same thing happens here. If the, if the, if the atoms are flying through and the photons that they're, they're past the photons in the bath that they're traversing are very far off resonance from any of the absorption resonances of the atoms, uh, then the atoms, atoms will pretty much fly right through also and incur only these, uh, these kind of dielectric dispersive effects. The atoms will not absorb any of the photons. And so by this analogy, we can construct a photon sensor uh, out of atoms, just sending them flying through the cavity. And they can detect the presence of these photons without destroying those photons. And you can send many, many atoms through the cavity and measure the same photon many, many times. And so this is called the quantum non-demolition measurement. Again, this is some terminology that you might come across in quantum sensing. You can measure a system without destroying it. Okay, so this was first demonstrated in Serge Hiroshi's uh, 2012 Nobel Prize. Atoms fly through, uh, uh, prepare a beam of Rydberg atoms. You prepare them in the atomic clock state. You send them flying through a cavity where there's so, there may or may not be a photon. Uh, and that photon, if it's there, will slow down the atomic clock. Uh, that's a, it's an atomic clock that's flying through space. Uh, and then you have a second cavity that reads out that atomic clock to see how many ticks uh, it had uh, accumulated. And he found that he could uh, obtain heat, uh, single photon sensitivity with this technique. In quantum computing, this is called the controlled phase gate. And this is pretty much uh, the basis for reading out information from your quantum RAM uh, using uh, using whatever your qubit is. Okay, 
So this can all be quantified with equations that perhaps I don't need to go into too much, but just the point is that uh, the atomic frequency shift turns out to be quantized according to the number of photons in the cavity. And that's why it's so useful uh, to, to use uh, QRAMs uh, to store quantum information. Uh, you have you, you can non-destructively read out that QRAM and ascertain whether it contains a single excitation or no excitations, zeros or ones. Um, so I, I won't go into this, but you can write down the Hamiltonian. It turns out the frequency of the atom is this quantity in parentheses, and it depends on the number operator, the number of photons in the cavity. Okay, so you can use uh, Various kinds of qubits, it almost doesn't matter what you use. There's pros and cons of each. You can use a Rydberg atom. Uh, Rydberg atom is a two level system uh, because the restoring force for electrons bound to nuclei uh, follows a Coulomb potential, which is not a, a parabolic quadratic potential. Um, or you can use a Josephson junction, which has a cosine potential, which looks kind of like the harmonic or parabola down here, but really as you go to larger and larger amplitudes, the restoring force becomes smaller and smaller. And the nonlinearity in this potential is what allows you to make uh, two level systems and artificial atoms uh, out of this stuff. And I'm running out of time, so I'm just gonna skip ahead a little bit. Oops. So here's the idea. Uh, we're going to be using qubits instead of Rydberg atoms. Qubit is again based on a Josephson junction, which is kind of like you can think about this as a, a, a superconducting capacitor with a nonlinear inductance associated with it. Um, so it's a 250 micron scale, is the, is the size of this uh, capacitive region, Josephson junction. And the nice thing about uh, Josephson junction qubits is that unlike uh, Rydberg atoms, which whose sizes are fixed to be about micron scale, uh, because this is a fabricated nonlinear oscillator, uh, you can go ahead and attach large antenna to it to improve uh, its response. So remember, you want to match the antenna size to the wavelength of radiation the photons that you're trying to measure. So there's no problem sticking antennas onto these circuits, whereas it would be a really, really big problem to try to stick antennas onto, an, uh, onto a real Rydberg atom. So now we have a millimeter scale device, which is fairly well matched to centimeter scale wave uh, gigahertz radiation inside a microwave cavity. Uh, and so now, again, you might have photons in this cavity that were uh, deposited by some force acting on this cavity. And we're going to try to measure that force uh, that created the photons uh, via uh, this kind of dielectric or dispersive effect uh, that uh, the photons have on the atomic clock frequency of this tiny little artificial atom that we stuck in there. Here's another picture of one of our experiments. We have a, a cavity uh, that's uh, made by drilling holes into a block of aluminum su such that the holes are, are sufficiently small and sufficiently long that the photons in this region in the middle cannot leak out. And then you just uh, put in a little sapphire slide uh, with one of these qubits in there. And again, you can't actually see the Josephson junction. All you can see is the antenna and the antenna size is a pretty good fraction of the actual cavity size and so that means you have really good antenna coupling. Okay, so here's some actual data of the frequency uh, of this artificial atom that we see when we drive the cavity mode uh, with just a, with a signal generator. We, then we generate a Poisson distribution of photons inside the cavity. Uh, and if we do uh, spectroscopy, if we just uh, measure the frequency spectrum, the frequency response, of this artificial atom, again, just by scattering probe waves off of it, we see this kind of frequency response. And we can interpret these discrete peaks as corresponding to different photon occupation numbers inside the cavity. So we have single photon resolution, we can count photons, and we can actually count these photons, as I said before, without actually absorbing them. Okay, uh, so this is kind of the standard atomic clock picture. So again, you want to see if, uh, if the clock frequency has changed uh, from what you expect it to be. So you first have to measure the clock frequency to know what you expect in the presence of zero photons. And so, so you start with the ground state of the atom. You, uh, send a, you give that atom, uh, that atomic oscillator, a little bit of a push to send it up to <coughs> this clock state, this uh, 
Schrodinger's cat superposition of ground and excited. And because it's a mixture of ground and excited, the ground component and the excited component advance in phase at different rates. And so the superposition that you get uh, uh, processes around the equator here. And exactly the right moment, you uh, send a, a little bit more energy. And if, it, if the state uh, had returned to its original position, when you send the, give it another uh, little push in phase, then it pushes it all the way up uh, to the excited state. And that only happens if, uh, if your hypothesis that the clock frequency is what you originally measured it to be, and so the timing of your pushes is exactly right, uh, then you've, uh, you've successfully moved from the initial ground state to the excited state, and that means the clock had not changed. Or you can make a hypothesis that the second push comes only if the clock frequency has changed by this quantized amount, and in which case, if you successfully flip from the ground state to the excited state, that would be evidence that there was actually a single photon in that cavity. And so that's the experiment we actually do. The qubit spin, whether it's a spin down or spin up, flips only if the cavity photon is present. Oops. Okay, so here we're plotting over a series of measurements of the same qubit. Uh, the probability that it's in the ground state and the probability that it's in the excited state. So it's an excited state. Okay, so again, we start with the qubit uh, that's in the ground state. So the probability is 100% in the ground state, 0% in the excited state. And then we just keep on making measurements. We make 100 of these kind of atomic clock measurements. And if uh, there was a dark matter wave uh, in the background that gave it a little push, uh, now there's a single photon in the cavity. And when you repeat this procedure, this atomic clock measurement procedure, uh, the first time you do it, the ground state transitions to the excited state. So the probability of being ground is zero, the probability of being excited is one, 100%. And you keep on making that measurements of that same photon. And every time you do the atomic clock measurement procedure, the state flips from, uh, from spin, spin down, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, spin up. Uh, you've made about 10 measurements of that same photon. And now you're pretty confident uh, that uh, there really is a photon in that cavity. And there can even be glitches, like since there can be errors, the technology doesn't have to be perfect. So nine out of the 10 measurements say that there was a photon in the cavity. One of them uh, got screwed up somehow and uh, was indeterminate. So nine out of 10 is good enough for me. We've discovered the dark matter. Let's go collect our Nobel prizes. Okay, so then at some point, uh, the photons don't live forever in the cavity. The cavity walls are a little bit absorptive through various loss mechanisms. That photon goes away, and then your procedure measures nothing, 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 nothing. Um, the qubit was left in its excited state at the end of this procedure just by pure chance. Then after some period of time, uh, the qubit also has some lifetime and it decays. Okay, so now the qubit is in the ground state and nothing happens for a long time. For the next 20 measurements, nothing happens. And then here's another interesting thing that could happen. Uh, the qubit gets spontaneously excited. And this is, uh, this is due to some deposition of energy from some external source uh, directly onto the qubit, not related to whatever's happening with the cavity. So the qubit gets excited. There's no photon in the cavity, but the qubit has absorbed energy from something. Uh, and so uh, uh, it's not because of anything you did. <laughs> it's just you measured it and it's strangely excited already. And so you repeat the procedure because there's no photon in the cavity. You don't get these spin flips. And so you can detect, you can distinguish between photon, events that are due to photons in the cavity and events due to direct hits on the qubit. And after some period of time, the qubit decays again. Okay, so I'm kind of out of time, um, but I just want to mention that uh, through this technology, we've pretty much uh, reduced the uh, effective noise levels uh, by a factor of about 40 below the zero point noise. And this is currently the world champion of any quantum metrology scheme, uh, better than anybody has done in any other field. And we've applied this to uh, dark matter detection. Uh, so pr remember previously I showed you there's some limits coming from the linear amplifier technique and for our qubit measurements, we far surpassed uh, the sensitivity of, of those. So this is the coupling strength versus the frequency or mass of the signal. Um, I just want to, in the last five minutes, I just want to quickly go a little bit more into what's happening in these kinds of events where you have spontaneous qubit errors uh, that aren't really due to uh, background photons in the cavity, uh, but 
due to actually impacts of, 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 uh, of uh, radiation directly onto the qubit devices. Okay, so quantum computers versus ionizing radiation. So uh, one form of ionizing radiation is cosmic ray events. So energetic photons from the galaxy or extra galactic uh, uh, protons or, or charged nuclei smashing the Earth's atmosphere and creating showers of particles that come raining down on us uh, and disrupting our electronics. Um, so here's a picture of uh, effects of uh, radiation passing through uh, a silicon CCD. You can see muons passing through, electrons wandering through, uh, and alphas and gammas producing blips of, uh, of energy deposit. And it turns out in silicon-based computers, uh, these errors are, are well known. They're called single event upsets. Uh, and they're actually believed to have given, if you look it up, they're believed to have given a, a affected a voting machine in a 2003 election in Belgium, giving a, a candidate uh, a number of extra votes that ends up being uh, some power of two. So if you see a, a candidate win by some power of two, then you should be suspicious. Uh, and of course, they can also give you superpowers. Okay, so uh, probably the only kind of external radiation that can penetrate uh, through the many walls of a typical cryostat are the gamma rays. So the alphas and betas, the electrons can stop very, fairly, can stop those fairly easily and the gamma rays uh, and the neutrons can pass right through. So you can mitigate this with extra lead shielding or heavy, heavy copper shielding around your uh, quantum computer package. And so the qubit is stored in this little magnetic shield here. And, yikes. Okay, so uh, it's now well known that ionizing radiation produces uh, an error rate in superconducting qubit CPUs at a rate of about uh, one per minute. And this was dramatically shown in this uh, Google paper where they said that they indicated the Sycamore chip undergoes 100% chip-wide failure once per minute in response to ionizing radiation. And they can localize the events both in space and time. So you can see the error rate spreading out uh, in, in time. So uh, good, good CPU, and then suddenly there's a hit and 100% of, uh, you have 100% error rate in this qubit, 99% error rate in this qubit, whatever. And the way you can understand this is if you have some cosmic radiation or other ionizing radiation passing through a one millimeter silicon substrate, then uh, just by the beta block equation, you can estimate this deposits about 100 keV of energy in the form of, uh, let's say, ionized particles, broken, broke, uh, excited electron hole pairs, and when they recombine, they uh, send uh, heat out in the form of phonons. And the phonons fly through the substrate, bounce around many times. They hit the thin film superconductors on the surface uh, that your uh, quantum materials or your, your, your qubits are made out of. Uh, and you have 100 keV of energy, but it only takes 10 to the minus four electron volts to break Cooper pair. So you break many, many Cooper pairs. And then as these broken single charges tunnel across the Josephson injunction, uh, they can either absorb the energy that was stored in the qubit oscillator and take the state from one down to zero, causing spontaneous decay of that qubit state, or they can transfer energy to the qubit and sponta spontaneously excite the qubit state from zero to one. Okay. And so when, when this happens, uh, there's so much energy involved, this happens to pretty much every single qubit on the chip. Okay, I'll skip that. And it turns out that this Google Sycamore chip looks almost exactly like uh, a typical dark matter detector uh, that we use in the dark matter field. We have some substrate, silicon or germanium in this case, uh, which is the target medium uh, for the dark matter. So we want the dark matter to come in and scatter in the target medium, deposit energy. And as the phonons bounce around, we collect them with superconducting fins and measure them with some very sensitive sensor called transition edge sensor. It's kind of a thermometer, which measures the total energy deposit. Uh, but it turns out the noise of these guys is fairly high. Uh, so it's only kind of sensitive if you break uh, more than 10 to the five Cooper pairs. And what I showed before was that the qubits in Google's quantum computer are sensitive to just a single broken Cooper pair. You don't have to break 10 to the five of them, just break a single one and it's fine. So in principle, you could make a far more sensitive uh, readout for these kinds of uh, calorimetric detectors if you do the readout with qubits. 
So Google claims to be working on quantum computing, but we think that they're secretly trying to win the Nobel Prize for detecting dark matter. Okay, and maybe I'll just skip ahead. Uh, one of the things we're doing in Quantum Science Center uh, is we're going to apply our dark matter expertise to try to benefit uh, quantum computing. So uh, we're going to be installing dilution refrigerator test tents 100 meters underground at Fermilab. And these will be based on an existing uh, Nexus prototype te uh, test stand for prototyping dark matter experiments. So it's just kind of a standard dilution refrigerator, uh, but the benefit is it's underground with smooth stone walls with no radioactive, radioactive elements in the concrete that you would normally get in a university basement. Plus we have extra lead shielding that we actually place inside the cold volume in addition to the lead shielding we'll place all around the out exterior of the dilution refrigerator. So being deep underground will protect us from the cosmic rays and all this lead shielding and the lack of uh, concrete on the walls will protect us against natural radioactivity. Uh, and maybe I'll just end there um, and take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Dr. Cho. So uh, let's give a round of applause. Um, so I think we have time for one question from the audience, if there are any. Yes. Hello, Dr. Cho. Uh, thank you very much for your talk, sir. Um, I would like to know what the different type, types of noises are uh, you encountered during your experiments. I think you briefly mentioned uh, back action noise and are thermal noises a problem at such lower temperatures? And what about uh, shot noise? And how do you go about lowering these uh, different types of noises? Thank you. Yeah, okay, Th that's an excellent question. Um, so uh, what happens in uh, these uh, uh, microwave experiments uh, is you try to operate in a dilution refrigerator uh, so that there uh, pretty much is no thermal photon background. So you want to cool the refrigerators enough down to tens of millikelvin so that at uh, a, a few gigahertz frequency, there are no uh, thermal photons present. Uh, and this is actually uh, why uh, people like to um, operate their qubits uh, at the, in the few, few gigahertz range uh, because it's fairly easy to cool down to 10 millikelvin and get rid of all of the thermal noise. Um, so the back action noise I mentioned is pretty much the same thing as the zero point noise. So it, it's what comes from uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So you can imagine that if you have a particle and you want to measure its position, uh, to measure its position, you have to interact with it. So to interact with it, you probably uh, shoot another particle at it and uh, see uh, whether other particle uh, bounces off of it or not. Okay, so if you uh, set the part other particle pass and you missed, it didn't bounce, that means the particle's not there, but then you're trying to measure it's not there. But if you have a direct hit, then the other particle will bounce off and you say, oh, there is, uh, this is where, this is the position of the thing I was trying to measure. Uh, but because you bounced a particle off of it, uh, you scattered it, uh, and then this, this, the original thing you're trying to measure recoils due to the momentum that got transferred. And that's what we mean by back action noise. Typically, measuring a system means you've interacted with it, and interacting with it means you've done something to it. Uh, and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle uh, kind of encodes the fact that if you want to measure positions, uh, you're going to transfer momentum to the particles that you're trying to measure. Um, but I showed a version of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in, in um, polar coordinates that says that uh, uh, the uncertainty in, in number uh, times the uncertainty in phase, uh, uh, it has to be greater than, than one half. So that means if you try to measure uh, the number of, uh, uh, of photons in, in a sine wave, uh, then you're going to do something that's going to scramble the phase a little bit. Uh, and similarly, if you want to measure the phase of that sine wave, you're going to do something that's going to uh, probably increase or decrease its amplitude. Uh, so it's a little bit hard to think about that, but uh, that's ultimately uh, the, uh, if you think about it a little bit, that's what's going to happen. Uh, but it turns out uh, if you actually are never measuring the phase of the sine wave, you're doing photon counting and you actually don't care about the phase. You just want to see if there was a force uh, that added some number of photons 
uh, to your receiver, uh, your receiving oscillator. Uh, then you can just go ahead and measure that photon number over and over again. Every time you've measured, you've put some uh, extra noise into the phase, you've scrambled the phase, uh, but you don't really care about the phase anyway. All you cared about was amplitude, and that's how you can evade that kind of noise. Uh, and then the last question, uh, last part was uh, whether there's shot noise in the measurement. And yes, that's absolutely true that there is shot noise in the measurement. So the shot noise in this case is the shot noise in the number of photons uh, that were created when the dark matter interacted with that cavity mode. So the dark matter will create some average number of photons. So if it creates, uh, let's say, 10 photons, uh, then sometimes instead of reading out 10 photons, we'll read nine, sometimes we'll read eight, sometimes we'll read 11. So there is some shot noise involved in the signal level. That's absolutely correct. Thank you again, Dr. Cho. Um, so with that, we have a 30 minute break. So we'll meet back here at 1110. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone.
Hey, you guys, can you hear me?
Hello. It's a... Hello, Dr. Sornberger. If you'd like to, we can stop sharing from this end and you can start sharing your screen if you'd like. Sounds good. One second. Okay, there you are. Very good. Okay, you can see that? Yes. Excellent. Yeah, it looks good. And we're going to start what in a few minutes? Yeah, we'll we'll start in about five minutes or so once we gather the the crowd back. Sounds good. How many people are there in the auditorium? Uh, well, today a lot of the early lectures are virtual, so we've got uh, only about a handful. But right. There's multiple people online. Right. But overall, we've been getting um, up to anywhere 40, 50 people at any given lecture. Nice. Are, are there a lot of people that have come in person? I'm sorry? Are there a lot of people who've come in person? Uh, yeah, like um, we got several uh, tens of hours, like about seven or eight postdocs and graduate, graduate students from out of town, a lot of local Purdue students showing up. And of course we have got the other in-person invited speakers. So we had a great uh, turnout at our uh, opening reception, a very robust uh, poster session with over 28 posters being presented by students and postdocs and all the um, postdocs winning awards for uh, the QSC fellowship are- Oh, that's right. Are, yep. Uh, presenting today. Nice, nice. That'll be great. So um, when, once we start to gather people up around uh, 10 past, uh, Zach is gonna read out, read out a brief intro for you and then pass it off to you. Sounds good. And this is being live streamed, is that right too? No, it, it should be on. Yeah, we can uh, we can see your screen just fine. You no, know, I said this is being live streamed. It is. Is it is it okay with you that we're streaming this on YouTube? Oh yeah, it is. Yeah, it's totally fine. Okay, thank you.
back, everybody. It is 10 past, so we're going to go ahead and continue with our uh, recorded or our virtual lectures. Um, so next we have Andrew Sorenberger of Los Alamos National Laboratory, a multifaceted research scientist and thought leaders in the areas of neuroscience, statistical data analysis, and quantum computing, with a passion for helping organizations move past what is present, obvious, and known. Dr. Andrew Sorenberger is the, Los Alamo, or is the quantum algorithms and simulation lead at the Quantum Science Center uh, at Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew. Thanks very much. Yeah, that was, I think, taken off of my LinkedIn uh, page. So, uh, <laughs> but yes, I'm at Los Alamos and, uh, and I'm in the QSC and I work uh, in, uh, with, you know, the algorithms work research that we do. Um, and uh, today, what I'm going to do is just start off with a little bit of kind of uh, introduction to research in the Department of Energy. Then I'll talk a little bit about algorithms research in the QSC. That just will just take a few minutes, and then I'll get to the main talk, which um, is on quantum machine learning applications uh, in quantum simulation and quantum metrology. So um, the DOE is one of the main uh, funders um, of research in, in the United States and probably in the world. Um, and I'm assuming that you guys are all, because you're interested in quantum computing, you, you're already curious about how the universe works and solving hard problems. Um, the different Department of Energy labs are great places to do that. And one of the kind of simple reasons for that is it's the best funded um, you know, research system uh, in the United States and, and probably also in the world. Um, it's definitely the largest scientific research system. Um, it started in World War II uh, and I'm at Los Alamos and I'm sure that you know that you know, we built the first uh, nuclear weapons um, but nowadays, work in you know research in the DOE is is has gone far beyond that, um, and involves problems you know not just in physics but in biology and other you know chemistry, other um, you know disciplines, and uh, and it almost always and this is one of the things that I love about it, it's multidisciplinary teams are the are the kind of um, the fundamental units of research. And you get to work with, you know, people that are experts in many different disciplines. And this is one of the things that really helps push our research forward. Um, you know, since World War II, uh, we've done a lot with, uh, you know, explosives and, and nuclear weapons, but we also work on, you know, in high energy physics, um, cosmology, biology, more biology. I'm just kind of trying to outline uh, some of these uh, um, little, little blurbs here. Um, you know, wind power uh, and, you know, efficient energy. Uh, and so all of these things are uh, part of the purview of the DOE uh, national labs nowadays. And so, um, you know, and this includes, of course, quantum computing and the national quantum initiatives, um, all of the quantum science center, or all of the quantum uh, centers that have been established under the NQI um, involve at least one and probably more of the DOE national labs. There are 17 of them. Uh, I'm at the, so actually, there's a little bit of a, of a subdivision. The uh, National Nuclear Security Administration labs include Los Alamos, Sandia, which is in Albuquerque, uh, also in New Mexico, and then also Lawrence Livermore. And we're the labs who do focus a little bit more on nuclear uh, issues. But of course, we do a lot of other stuff. And then the other labs, for instance, Pacific um, Northwest National Lab, which is part of the QC, QSC, um, Oak Ridge, 
Uh, these are all part of the uh, Office of Science labs. And then there are other ones with specific missions. Um, but all of these kind of do really cool work. And so the QSC is part of this national quantum initiative. It's one of the five centers that were funded. And um, as they said in my introduction, um, I'm the research thrust lead for the quantum algorithms and simulation thrust. And so just to give you an idea of the sort of stuff that we're doing, um, we're just one of three thrusts, um, but we focus, focus more on you know, algorithms and, and the theory of quantum computation. And we are doing work, we have projects in, you know, kind of fundamental quantum algorithm design. We have projects in applications of quantum algorithms, you know, for things like simulation uh, and also sensing. And then we also have uh, work being done on quantum software, um, you know, which is of course necessary in order to enable um, these, you know, the, the, the development of and, and testing of algorithms uh, and, of, and of applications of the algorithms. Um, the, the way that our particular thrust is set up is it's meant to, to have synergies between all of the different components. Of course, you know, if you have quantum algorithm research going on, um, as you improve your algorithms, you know, in particular, we, we work on making the algorithms more efficient um, in various ways. And, but as these are developed, they can then be used by uh, the projects doing applications. And then the software kind of underpins all of that research and uh, makes it more efficient, you know, by just making it easy to do and by optimizing uh, codes and so forth. And then in particular, the, the applications work that we, we do is related to the broader work of the QSC. So in our applications, in, in, in our implementations of things like quantum algorithms um, for topological systems, we study systems which are relevant to the work that's done in the materials thrust. And in fact, um, you know, we kind of work in co-design with some of the projects there uh, taking in some of the uh, systems, for instance, quantum spin liquids that are studied there and, um, you know, working to develop uh, algorithmic implementations, uh, simulations in order to study them. And then the same thing's true uh, with the devices and sensors thrust, in particular with sensors, we've been working to, uh, um, to develop quantum sensing algorithms. In other words, protocols based on quantum computing principles and quantum information principles that can be used to improve uh, quantum sensing. Okay, so that that's, I just wanted to give that bit of an introduction. So you kind of know uh, where, where our work sits, um, both in the QSC and in, in the Department of Energy. And so now I'm going to give uh, it's, it's a kind of maybe more of a lecture than a talk, but I'll start off by talking about quantum machine learning in a particular subroutine or module that is used often in quantum machine learning. And uh, I'll give a little bit of a tutorial or a pedagogic, um, you know, uh, presentation of, of why it works. Um, and then once I've discuss that in a little bit of detail, I'll move on to uh, how that particular module can be used in order to uh, improve near-term quantum simulations and also some applications in, in uh, what I'll call quantum metrology. So the subroutine that I wanted to talk about is, uh, is quantum compilation, or in fact, this subroutine here is called the Hilbert Schmidt test, but the idea is what's called quantum compilation and our algorithm we called quantum assisted quantum compilation. And the idea here is uh, an idea that's common to all machine learning, whether it's classical or quantum. Um, in, in machine learning context, essentially you have uh, typically a, a system of interest, 
which I'm writing down here as, as U. In the quantum context, it's a unitary, but in general machine learning, it doesn't have to be. Um, and then you have another system. So, so U I'm thinking of as being fixed. It's a, a fixed system of interest for studying. And, but V here is another system, but it's a parameterized system. And so I can modify the parameters in V in order to try to make V be closer to you, right? So the, the learning part of this is modifying the parameters here. And the goal of the learning is for V to become a model of the system U. And the simple way uh, to think about this is in terms of, of this uh, inner product here between two matrices, right? So V and U are unitaries. We can think of them as matrices. And the Hilbert-Schmidt inner product is, uh, is asking how close the, the matrix V is to U. Or you could also say how close the operator V is to U, okay? And so this, this quantum circuit here represents a, a quantum machine learning subroutine. Uh, we called it the Hilbert Schmidt test because it's computing the Hilbert Schmidt inner product between these two operators. Um, and what I want to do today before I go into applications is, is go into detail about what the heck it is this thing's doing, right? You can see from this diagram that already there's some structure here. We have some uh, a, a register, we'll call it the A register here of qubits. We have another register, the B register. Um, these are in ancillas. You can see there's, there are these C knots coming down uh, and those are serving to entangle these ancillas with, with this, in, in this register with what's going on in this register. And then you can see this dotted box here labeled E in this one, E dagger and so forth. And so what I wanna do next is just go into what the heck is going on in this circuit and why does it, why you, can you use this circuit in order to make this comparison and to make it efficiently? And so, you know, I'm sure you guys, if you work with quantum computation, you've seen this textbook, I would suggest that you, you know, check it out if you haven't, and then for more advanced stuff, Mark Wilde's quantum information theory is a nice, a nice uh, textbook. All right, so here we go. This is, we're dealing with uh, qubits here. So a qubit is a spin system. It's a, it's a you know, you can think of it as a, a single spin. Uh, and it's described by two basis vectors and a couple of complex numbers. And if you want to understand how, you know, uh, how that plays out in terms of standard linear algebra, um, you, know, you can rewrite this as a um, list of numbers, you know, a, a, a vector in linear algebra, alpha and beta now show up here. And then these two basis, uh, basis states in the Dirac notation translate into just uh, you know, a couple of orthogonal vectors in the standard uh, algebraic sense, each of them multiplied by their own respective uh, complex number. And so now if we go to a couple of spins, um, we have to consider all of the possible states that these spins can be in. And um, so in this case, we have, four different possible states. And this of course is because we're considering a probabilistic uh, you know, uh, representation of this state. This is actually the, uh, you know, the, this is what people call the amplitude of the amplitudes of the state. Um, but we have to make sure that we keep all of the possible configurations that the system can be in. And then when we translate it to linear algebra, again, each of these states ends up being an orthogonal vector. Um, here, we're just using the Euclidean axes and then all of the coefficients 
multiply those axes. So very straightforward. Um, and and the thing to to note about when we're about the structure of this system is that as we add each new degree of freedom in terms of a spin, we we double the size of the system. So if I have n spins, they're going to be described by a two to the n dimensional Hilbert space, and that is um, is significant um, because it means that quantum systems get complicate can get complicated quickly as you add more degrees of freedom to them. And this is just the general way that we think about um, you know quantum systems in quantum computing, and uh, you know when I wrote down the this this diagram, right? It has these typical operations show up in these little boxes or as these little you know connecting lines. Uh, and I'm going to quickly go through how that looks. So here we have an initial state. There's a quantum operation that acts on it, and when we translate that, the operation turns into a unitary matrix. You'll notice that I've I haven't uh, normalized this. I should have a one over the square root of two here, but that's okay. Um, psi one and, he, and psi two here are equivalent to the alpha and beta that I was just talking about. And so phi one will end up being one linear combination of psi one and psi two, and phi two will end up being another linear combination of those. And so this is, so what this Hadamard operation does is it takes these two, uh, two states and it mixes them. Okay, so now we're starting to get into uh, some into this operation here where we have a Hadamard, but we have in addition, this is a CNOT. And the in uh, this combination here is a set of operators that make a bell state. And so this is important because a bell state um, has correlations which are uh not classical correlations they're quantum correlations and so a bell state is an example of an entangled state that can't exist classically and this will be important for this circuit that we're talking about so in this case we have a couple of qubits we run them we run the top qubit psi one through this h h actually is it called a hadamard gate hence the h and then a C naught here. And if we translate that into linear algebra, then the, we have to remember that H is acting on Psi one, but at the same time, Psi two is, under, is, is undergoing an identity operation, you can think of it. And in order to write down the matrix that's, that represents that operation, you have to use the Kronecker product. So we have H, Kronecker product with I that looks like this. And you can see that H, the components of H are showing up in these little um, diagonals. Let me just remind you, H looks like one, one, one minus one. Here we have a diagonal of ones, diagonal of ones, diagonal of ones, and diagonal of minus ones. So that's how this looks uh, in a matrix. And then the C naught is uh, interesting. It, it can't be written as a Kronecker product. It has to be written as a sum of Kronecker products. You, you can look at this. This is a projector zero. And what this is saying is that if the, uh, if the input state has a zero in it, then flip the, uh, then, then flip the other qubit. Whereas if the, sorry, if the input state has a zero in it, don't flip, uh, leave the other qubit the way it is. Whereas if it does have a one in it, if it is a one, then flip the second qubit. And so if you combine these two operations, you end up with these operations. Let's focus on the top one. You put in two zeros and it, and it gives you this um, uh, fully entangled state. This, it gives you this bell state, which like, as I said, is uh, non-classical. 
and you'll notice that I put the square root of two in here, although I forgot it here again. Okay, so now this is probably the most important uh, thing to understand for this circuit. And I've done it just in a simple, I have, I have the two registers here, but each register is just a single qubit. So for instance, if I go back to my original uh, circuit here, I'm, I'm simplifying this, I'm throwing away A2 through AN, throwing away B2 through BN. So I've just got H and the C naught, uh, and then the operator U is just acting on the A register, meaning here it's just acting on the first qubit. And so if you work out what this operation is on these two qubits, it's quite interesting. And I'm gonna focus, because this is what's important for our circuit, I'm gonna focus on an initial condition where psi one is zero and psi two is zero. So both qubits are in the down, uh, down spin state. So this is our input. And what comes out is this state here. And this is quite interesting. And let me tell you why. So U is a unitary operator acting on this single qubit. And it has components U11, U12, U21, and U22. And what's happened via this set of operations is we've generated a new state it's called a choice state. In that state, each of the coefficients of the basis states in this new state, which is a superposition of all of these, has a different element that comes from this matrix U. So if I were doing classical linear algebra, I would call this a rasterization. I'm taking you know, a square matrix and I'm just kind of uh, taking all the columns or all the rows and putting them uh, one after the other. It's the same thing that's going on here. And I end up with all of the elements of this matrix in this vector. Okay, so I've kind of rasterized the vector, sorry, rasterized the matrix into this vector. And this is called, so the relationship between the matrix U and the, and the Choi state is called the Choi Jamiokowski isomorphism. Um, and uh, it's also, this operation is also called, or the, this idea is also called map state duality. The fact that you can always take, a, take a, an operator and uh, construct a choice state from it, and you can also go the other way. Okay, so why is this interesting for, for our, um, our circuit here? our Hilbert, Hilbert Schmidt test circuit. So if we look at what the state is here where we have these dashed lines, the state is a choice state coming from the left. We could also think of, of constructing the adjoint of a choice state coming from the right. Okay, so what I have here is I have a, a choice state which has all the information in U, and then I have an adjoint choice state, which has the all, all the information in V. So effectively, what this circuit does is it forms an inner product between two choice states. The choice states have all the in information in, in each of these unitaries. And so what's ending up happening is we're comparing every single element of one, uh, one unitary with every single element of the other unitary, you know, pair by pair. And that gives us a, that is a, um, a that, that is, a, get, computes for us the Hilbert Schmidt inner product. And so the probability of getting the zero state out here is, um, is proportional to the distance between U and V. So with this circuit, I can measure this Hilbert Schmidt inner product. And the cool thing about this is that here, I'm just comparing 
two by two matrices. It's straightforward. This would be trivial to do, you know, on a, in a piece of paper. However, um, you can grow the number of the size of the registers here, like we did to start with. And as you grow the size of the registers, you need n qubits per register, so two, two n qubits. But with just two n qubits, we can uh, we can compare two two to the n by two to the n matrices. Okay, so that means that that so that's an exponential difference um, in terms of the the resources, the qubit resources that you need in order to make this comparison. Right, you would need uh, two to the n by two to the n bits in order to make this uh, comparison classically, whereas you just need two to the two n bits qubits to do it quantum mechanically. Okay, so now we're back to our original diagram. You can see we put in all zeros here. We do this entangling operation on the pairs of qubits that generates these bell states. And then we run the top register through U, through V dagger, we run through E dagger, and then we perform a measurement. And so again, this and this are adjoints of each other. At this point, we have a choice state and it's, and it's adjoint. And this, this whole uh, circuit simply computes the inner product between these two matrices. And so if we get, if we put zeros in here, and if we have, uh, and if V were equal to U, then we would get zeros out. And when we measure this probability of getting zeros out, it's a measure of how close U and V are. Okay, so this is a, you know, quantum machine learning subroutine that we can use to do other things. Okay, so now I'm gonna start going into a little bit of uh, a, a few more details without a whole lot of explanation. Uh, you, you, I'm, I'm showing the citations and you know, feel free to take a look. But one of the main things to know about this circuit here is it's actually not the circuit that you wanna use, that you wanna use. And the reason why is there's a particular uh, problem that can show up in, in machine learning either quantum or classical. In, on the quantum side, it's called the barren plateau. On the classical side, it's called vanishing gradients. Um, but effectively, it's the, these are the same things, just two sides of the, two different sides of the same coin. Uh, and a barren plateau is a situation where um, if, you, if you move into the machine learning context, Right, so if I wanted to use this, uh, use this circuit in order to do machine learning, I have to be able, I, first I, I construct a cost, which is gonna tell me how close um, U and V are, but typically I would wanna use a gradient descent approach in order to modify parameters in V in order to get it close to U. And the statement of a, um, of a barren plateau here is that if you take the derivative of this circuit with respect to the parameters in V, in general, you're going to find yourself in a very flat landscape, meaning that the gradients around you are going to be exponentially small. And therefore, it's going to be virtually impossible for you to figure out which direction to go in in order to minimize the distance between U and V. And of course, that's going to be a problem uh, if you want to find a V that's close to U. Luckily, this circuit, which you may have noticed, this right-hand side is a little bit different. We're just me measuring one pair here and just doing one pair of measurements. But with this circuit, you can modify your cost function. Um, basically, you, you, you do a sum of different measurements of pairs of qubits here, and you end up with what we call the local Hilbert-Schmidt test. And that, um, that cost 
does not have a Barron plateau, at least for relatively short depth quantum circuits. So, so this is a circuit that, that I'll, I'll be using as I go along and talk about different applications. Okay, so one of the things that, that uh, I didn't you know, ex explicitly talk about, um, but you know, I, I mentioned that we call these entangling ancillas, and I uh, assumed in what I was talking about before that I had the same number of A's as I did B's, you know, there's the same number of qubits in the A register as there are in the B register. But it turns out that you can actually, you know, think about this circuit, throw away some of these ancillas and think about um, what you need to do in order to uh, kind of fully learn U with some V. And what I mean by that is this, say I threw away all, all of the ancillas, if I just put in the zero state here and I got the zero state out on the other side, that would be fine. Um, but it would only tell me the parts of B that depend on this basis uh, state U. And so what I would have to, if I threw away the ancillas, I wouldn't have this choice state anymore. Actually, and I'd also throw away you know, E and E dagger, um, what I would have to do is I'd have to run an exponential number of input states through, uh, through the whole system. And in, in, in each time I'd have to check that the, the state that I put in was the state that I got out. And then I'd have to do some learning and so forth. So it'd, it'd be very expensive, exponentially expensive, if I threw away this entanglement structure. But then I could maybe add one entangling ancilla, and maybe that would help. And then maybe I could add two and so forth. And you can do that. And we did that here. This is a numerical simulation. Um, and what you find is if you have no ancillas, then you do indeed need the, the complete size of the Hilbert space. This, is a, this was a five uh, qubit system. So this was a 64 dimensional Hilbert space. You do indeed need every single different basis vector in order to learn that um, the unitary. But as, as soon as I put in just one entangling ancilla, I can have the number of input output pairs I need to use. And then I add another and I have it again and so forth all the way down to putting in the full entangling register um, where then, where in that case, I develop the full choice state and I can measure, um, I just need to measure one input output pair. So um, this is kind of, you know, it's, it's interesting and this shows you how powerful entanglement can be in making this comparison between U and V because, you know, you just need, in this case, it's a 64 dimensional Hilbert space, but you just need, you know, one, two, three, four, five um, uh, ancillas in order to do the full comparison of, of these uh, unitaries if you use the entanglement. We actually showed this. Uh, this is on a Rigetti machine. Um, so, so here in, in this kind of tan color, uh, we had a, a unitary that we wanted to, to learn with no ancillas. It was just a, a single spin, a single qubit. And sure enough, it took two states in order to learn it and get, you know, get the, the training, the, the, the test risk down to zero. Whereas if we used an ancilla, it just took one, uh, one input output pair. Um, and so this, this aspect of, of entanglement, um, we called entanglement enhanced no free lunch theorems. And um, uh, this is because um, there was a previous paper that was published that said that machine learning could be um, possibly exponentially um, costly, and that was related to some of what are called classical no free lunch theorems. The fact that you have to learn on a training set, and then when you test, the generalization in, it, it can can be uh, poor, and and can can often you have to test over the entire system in order to get extreme. <clears throat> excuse me, extremely good. Um, uh, 
uh, trainability. Um, and so what we showed here, you know, uh, was that using entanglement, you could seriously reduce uh, that difficulty. Okay, so so I've talked about I've talked about this this machine learning approach where we we try and match a unitary U with another unitary V, um, and we call it quantum compilation because. Essentially, you could think maybe U would be a big unitary, but maybe there's a way to compress it or to compile it, so to speak, down into fewer gates. That's one possibility. Um, and um, it turns out there, there's other things also that you can do with this quantum compilation. And so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, uh, an approach to uh, near term. So NISC quantum simulation, um, that we've come up with that, you know, works pretty well in, in small systems. Uh, and so, you know, a typical quantum simulation, what's the, what's the difficulty of implementing quantum simulation on near-term machines, right? Noisy, non-fault tolerant quantum computers. So here's the difficulty. If you wanted to implement one of, you know, the best, quantum simulation uh, algorithms, you would need to implement operations like this. These are, these are all operations um, that if you wanted to uh, simulate Hamiltonian dynamics, you would need to use. And you can see there are ancillas hanging around. There's a lot of controlled gates that you need to generate and so forth. So the actual qubit systems that you need to look at are large. And the depth of these circuits is also huge and the number of entangling gates is also huge. And so all of these things are extremely difficult to, to uh, implement in a noisy system. You really need a fault tolerant. In fact, you need a quite large fault tolerant quantum computer in order to implement some of these, you know, really be theoretically beautiful um, quantum simulation methods. So what people do is they resort to one of the earlier methods for um, implementing quantum simulations, and that's called the, a, a trotter method. And the trotter method is, is fairly straightforward. Um, and the ideas in this uh, diagram here, first we construct some initial state. Let's assume that we know what that is and we can do that in, in, in an efficient way. Then somebody gives us a Hamiltonian and there are methods for approximating the time evolution due to a Hamiltonian for a short time that are called trotterizations or trotter-Suzuki decompositions. And uh, so the idea in a trotter-based simulation is to construct one of those short time uh, quantum evolution, uh, you know, um, quantum evolutions in some gates, that'll, that'll take your initial state and it'll bring you to, you know, the time evolved uh, state after time delta T. And then if you want to keep going for some, you know, longer time, you just iterate that, uh, you iterate that trotter step. And so you can see the, the problem with this, e even though this uses, you know, doesn't use a lot of ancillas, it doesn't have a whole lot of, you know, it doesn't necessarily have a lot of controlled gates. Um, and, and the depth of the trotterization maybe could be, you know, reined in a little bit. Because you have to iterate it, you're always going to go past the coherence time of your non-fault tolerant quantum computer. So the question is, how do you get around that? Is there any way uh, to fix that? And we came up with an idea for doing it. Okay. So, um, and it involved quantum compilation. Okay. So let me tell you how this works. So this figure here on the top is just what I just talked about. We have some long time unitary that we want to divide it up into a, a bunch of trotter steps and uh, iterate the trotter steps. And then here again, we've got in this cyan 
dashed line, we hit the coherence time. And, you know, at around this point, our simulation doesn't work well anymore. You know, we're down to, you know, um, just completely noisy results that don't help us at all. Don't give us any information. So here's the idea. We have these trotter steps. So this, this is a trotter step, a unitary. It's an approximation to the unit, the evolution. And what we do is we're gonna use quantum compilation, not just to compile it down to a shorter size, right? As the compilation, you know, uh, word implies, but we're gonna use quantum, quantum compilation in order to in order to compile this into a particular structure. And what that structure is going to be is a unitary, which will represent eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian, a diagonal piece, and then the adjoint of the eigenvectors, okay? And you can see that this is, we're compiling the system unitary, the, the trotterization into a diagonal form. And what that means is that as long as we can do it, as long as we can get a short uh, bunch of gates, which will do this diagonalization, we can then just modify the parameters in the diagonal, multiply them by n, the number of time steps by hand in order to get a, 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 a new quantum simulation that'll go until time capital T. And so this circuit is exactly the same size as this circuit, but it can compute times, which if you trotterize them would be beyond the coherence time of the, of the uh, quantum computer. So in, in equations, right, we're taking the simulation that we want, we're breaking it into steps, we're, we're approximating those steps as trotter uh, unitaries. We're then using quantum compilation in order to diagonalize the trotterization. And when we do the expon exponentiation, it ends up just getting inserted into the parameters of the diagonal. And we can modify those in order to, to get a, what we call a fast forwarded quantum simulation. And the algorithm looks like this. Somebody gives us a Hamiltonian. We construct the trotterization. We take the trotterization and we use our uh, we use the the uh, Hilbert Schmidt test circuit um, and do gradient descent in an optimization loop until we get our um, our cost, meaning how close U and V are. And notice here that this is a slightly different form of the circuit, but it's it actually computes mathematically exactly the same thing. Um, so once we get the cost below a threshold, then we have an approximate fast forwarding circuit and we use it in order to perform a, a quantum simulation. And so here are some results. Uh, this is a, an XY model with five qubits. And you can see here in white, in, in the dashed line, that's just the, the standard trotterization. The dot dashed line is you can take the trotterization and use quantum compiling in order to try and compress it a little bit, which should help you. But of course it doesn't help that much because you do end up iterating beyond the coherence time. So both of these trotter approaches are, are um, you know, rapidly the fidelity goes down. Whereas with VFF, so the cyan line here is VFF, but not with a very small, we didn't optimize it very well. And you can see that of course doesn't work, but as you start optimizing more and more, you end up being able to do uh, very well and be able to uh, kind of easily uh, perform numerical or quantum simulations beyond the coherence time uh, that, you would, that you would need for a trotterization. So this was numerical work. This is uh, done on IBM Q Bogota. Um, and uh, here, this is just a, it's two plus two. So we had the A register was two qubits with a, a trotter unitary acting on that. 
the B register was the entangling ancillas. And you can see here, so if you, if you, you know, in a noiseless simulation, you perform the trotterization, that's, that's where you would like to be. Whereas if you implement that on, on quantum hardware, the noise rapidly kills you. Whereas with VFF, which is what we called our algorithm, variational fast forwarding, um, in, in the, the noiseless uh, um, simulation, uh, doesn't do quite as well as, as this because it, we still have to uh, implement the training uh, and, and how well VFF is going to work depends on the onsats you use and how well you can actually, how small you can get the cost. Um, but it still does quite, quite well. And here is what, how, it, how well it does with the uh, actual implementation on, on the chip. So this is the, the, you know, it's gonna be a noisy implementation, but again, because this circuit remains within the coherence time, it has much better performance than the trotterization. Okay, so um, the next thing I'm gonna talk about is, um, is a, a, basically a sim, a, an application of the same uh, same circuit and the same ideas um, to to metrology, and here is the idea. So this is kind of a sensing paradigm, but it's it's a little bit different. It's more like a state estimate or system estimation um, algorithm. So first of all, I'm I'm just switching gears on you right now. Um, this it turns out that you can implement that Hilbert Schmidt test. Um, or at least the analog in, of it in uh, uh, continuous variable systems. And we've done that, that's in this paper down here. Um, and so, so this just in your heads, think about this as being um, that Hilbert Schmidt circuit where this is one register, this is the other register. Um, and now, however, think about taking uh, one of these the equivalent of a, of, of a register and running it through an experiment, okay? So in other words, we have, think of this as being a quantum computer entangled with an experiment. And so V now is, represents a bunch of gates in the quantum computer, and it is going to, we're gonna upload a quantum model of this system that's sitting sitting on our our lab bench, and um, so so this is you know sort of some some kind of entanglement enhanced quantum system estimation. So, um, and the thing to compare this to is uh, process tomography, right? If you really wanted to know you classically you could generate a choice state from you, and then you'd have you know, two to the n coefficients and you'd have to measure them all very, you know, very well. It sort of be ex exponentially difficult, but you could get numbers out such that you would know all of the elements of the matrix that represents you, but it would be exponentially uh, costly. Whereas in this quantum machine learning context, we don't need to know all of these elements of the choice state. We just need to know some set of quantum gates that will generate that same choice state. And so that's what we're doing here. And so the algorithm is very similar to what we used for the quantum simulation. Um, only now our U is an actual experimental system. V is still a bunch of parameterized gates. And we still use, uh, here I wrote the, the Hilbert Schmidt uh, uh, circuit again, even though here I was using the continuous variable one. But again, we use gradient descent. We make sure that we're below a certain cost. And then we have a quantum model of the system that was sitting on our lab bench. And of course, we could also use the VFF idea and we could make a diagonal quantum model of it, 
um, if we wanted to. But so this is a, a fairly, to my mind, experimentally interesting application of quantum machine learning. And you know, the, the eventual idea, right? If we, once we have our exascale quantum computer um, would be to take, you know, the LHC and entangle the protons, you know, with our, with our quantum computer before they get smashed and then entangle all the center sensors, you know, they'd be quantum sensors and have them all entangled with our, with our uh, circuit and then just upload the system that is, that, that is this, you know, whatever Q, QCD, um, you know, uh, uh, system, something like that. So that's it. Um, you know, I, I tried to show that uh, entanglement can, can be a resource for quantum machine learning. Um, and you can kind of trade off training data with, with entangling ancillas. Um, you can use entanglement enhanced quantum machine learning uh, in order to, to diagonalize quantum simulation unitaries and then fast forward them. Um, and uh, I didn't show it, but we have, if you look at the papers, there's rigorous bounds on how much you can trust these simulations depending on the optimization error and the trotter error and so forth. Um, we've shown that it works both in simulation and experimentally. Um, and, uh, you know, moving forward, we're interested in looking at some of these entanglement enhanced quantum system estimation procedures. So that's all I've got. Any questions? Remberger, so let's give our speaker a round of applause. Um, yeah, and we have time for a number of questions from the audience. Like. Hi, Andrew. Uh, great talk. I love the algorithm. So how did you compute the uh, derivatives with respect to the variational parameters? Um, yeah, it turns out that you can do it with the same circuit, the Hilbert-Schmidt circuit. So um, it, it ends up that um, you can use what's called the parameter shift rule, I think, something. I, there's a, there's a, a rule that allows you to do it. Um, so it, and if you look in the VFF paper, uh, it's right there. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yep. Okay, I saw in the chat we have um, a question from Professor Keis, so I'll come up and, and read that off here. Yes, so I see it. So uh, Sabra has written, very nice talk. Can you please elaborate on the idea of using U and V, v adjoint for compressing the matrix? So, right, that's, that was kind of the, the simplest idea that comes up. Um, sorry, let me get back. Um, here we are. So um, in, Right, so we're, we're comparing U and V. And um, the idea of compressing the unitary effectively just means that we can, we can make an equivalent unitary with fewer gates. And um, so it's not necessarily the case that it's always going to be possible. But for instance, uh, like Wukai Chincho has shown using these sorts of techniques, that you can take like a QFT and often you can compress it down to half or less of its size. Um, so um, it just is a question of, can you find the right ansatz and the right parameters to do it? And you know, often the answer is yes. And it's just a question of using the machine learning in order to find that solution. Uh, thank you. Do we have any further questions from the audience? This has a follow-up question, actually. So he asks, um, is it related to doing, sorry, let me pull that up. Is it related to doing PCA? 
No, no, not to my knowledge. Um, because so in the context that I'm thinking of, it would not be a dimensional reduction. So yeah, so here we're looking at um, we're looking at trying to find a V that does exactly what U does, or at least with you know up to the cost finds exactly the same thing. There, you could intentionally reduce the the parameters and potentially um, change the structure of V so that. Um, you knew that it wasn't going to be able to encapsulate everything, but you were willing to look for an approximation. And in, in that case, you might be able to do it. You know, for instance, if you just in, in V here, if you simply left off, you know, an operator on one of the qubits or something and asked, can I find an effective operator that will give me the same thing? Um, you can do that. There are also uh, methods like autoencoder type methods um, that can be used in order to do it as well. Um, so, um, and, and that has, so, so I guess the, the answer is in general, no, but, but yes, you probably could use this, this procedure or this, this way of thinking in order to have, make that happen. A dimensional reduction, not necessarily PCA. I don't want to, I don't want to commit myself to that. Um, do we have any more questions for uh, Dr. Sarnberger? All right. So if not, I think we'll wrap up there for now. Uh, let's thank our speaker again. Um, so now we have lunch uh, as well as a poster session, and then we'll meet back here at 1.30 uh, for our next speaker. All right. Thanks, everybody.
Okay. Hey, y'all. Uh, quick announcement for those of you that will be riding back the bus back to the hotel. The bus will leave at 7.45 instead of 8.30 after dinner tonight. Let's see, I think it's uh, almost time for us to start. Maybe we'll wait for a few more stragglers to get in. Um, but uh, welcome back to uh, the fourth day. This is after lunch, uh, the fourth day of our uh, quantum science school. Uh, and it's, uh, I already took it down, but uh, this is the day of learning by uh, Cold Quanta. Uh, so um, on that same theme, uh, we can, our next speaker we should welcome down is uh, Dr. Alexander Rodnev. Um, Dr. Alexander is a lead quantum physicist at Cold, Quant Cold Quanta. Uh, Dr. Radnev received his PhD at Georgia Institute of Technology in 2012. After that, he spent six years in Silicon Valley uh, working on computer chip manufacturing, lasers, and data science. He then uh, has had a stint at NIST, where he built um, the NIST F3 atomic clock. And then from there, in 2020, he joined uh, Cold Quanta. Dr. Renev leads a team of 16 engineers and physicists to develop cold quanta's neutral atom quantum computers. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to you. Um, you're all mic'd up, so thanks. An introduction. That was nice feedback check. Do you hear me well? Sounds good. Hopefully people online are also hearing me well. Uh, also, please feel free to come closer, uh, people in the, in the far row, rows. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for having me here at the Quantum Science Center in this uh, Quantum Summer School. It's really exciting to see that the quantum skills are getting uh, educated on the large scale so that we have a great talent to move the quantum technology forward. So I'm very happy to be here to tell about uh, what we do at Cold Quanta. And my goals for today is to get connected and um, show you our quantum computer that we're building and explain how it works so you can explain it in hand-waving terms. Uh, if we have time, get into the quantum entanglement phenomenon a bit deeper. Uh, really a little how weird it is. And with that, I'd like to get a quick poll here. Uh, who is here um, in the graduate school? Okay, looks like the majority of people, that's awesome. And then who is in the engineering discipline? Okay. All right, and then how about uh, science like physics or chemistry? Okay, great. So roughly almost everybody in grad school and half engineers, half scientists. That's wonderful. And this is what I geared uh, the presentation for. And then about Cold Quanta myself. So Cold Quanta is a quantum company with the mission to bring uh, quantum to the world. There are multiple divisions at Cold Quanta that are uh, trying to achieve that, uh, starting from product lines to um, let researchers to build their uh, apparatus uh, without reinventing the wheel. Uh, so we can buy things off the shelf like BC machine or uh, a laser cooling apparatus. Uh, there is a, a huge division for doing the research in atomic clocks, inertial navigation sensors and so forth. And one of the newer divisions is quantum computing, which I represent is to build a quantum computer uh, that is useful to solve real problems. Uh, and a bit my, about myself, uh, so you heard the introduction. I have experienced the world of academia and industry, uh, moved back and forth and built lots of uh, equipment that is working, let's say, either uh, at Intel Fabs, those big machines that look at the computer chips that are in your phones, uh, or the based atomic clocks, and now building a quantum computer at Cold Quanta. All right, so. Why, we, uh, why am I here? Why am I talking about this? There are lots of hopes for quantum computing that it will solve real problems in the world. Uh, I listed a few. 
Uh, one example would be, you know, it takes, uh, if you train a deep learning model right now in a classical computer, you have to spend so much energy and produce carbon emissions that are worth of about three cars lifetimes. And it also takes some time. There is this hope that uh, with quantum computing, we can do computations, solve problems much faster uh, for a variety of reasons. Fundamentally, that we're using a completely different paradigm how we compute things, uh, exploring the quantum mechanics of the world. And then, the long story short, there are a bunch of platforms how you can build a quantum computer. Uh, I'm betting on uh, the atoms, and particularly the neutral atoms because we have a, a extraordinary control uh, of the systems. We can manipulate atoms very precisely, like the atomic clocks, um, probably the most accurate and precise uh, devices that humans build where you can measure something with 18 or 19 or 20 digits. All right, and then specifically the neutral atoms there, uh, I think there is a great scalability argument. Uh, there is a, no charge, you can start packing atoms in arrays like we do. It involves scaling, similar to you see in the semiconductor industry to keep it up with, with the Moore's law, where you start packing more transistors in a chip. You have this square law, uh, scalability, scalability working for you. And then there is this uh, fundamental problem with quantum computing you need to solve when you need to have a very good control of your qubits when you need them. But when you don't need it, you would want to isolate it completely from the environment so they don't lose the quantum information. And with this um, approach of the Greenberg interaction that we use and then they go into, uh, we solve that problem by turning that interaction strength of a qubit by one trillion times just with a couple of uh, lasers uh, in the sub microsecond uh, time. So like that is the fundamental physics that is enabling all of this uh, technology uh, to be materialized and solve real problems. Okay, and now that was a lot of uh, heavy text there. From now on, it's gonna be mostly pictures. So I'm gonna show you what actually looks in, in reality. This is the, a picture from a camera from our lab uh, that you see on the left, uh, there is the QPU, the quantum processing unit, the big box. That's where the magic happens. Uh, which I'm going to describe what exactly happened in there. Uh, then the behind it, there is a, a big uh, table with a bunch of expensive lasers. Like overall, we're talking about million dollar uh, scale worth of equipment uh, in that room. All right, and then we've been building that for the past uh, few years. With, there was a design phase and thinking in 2019, 2020, and then we spent the most of the 2020 building the laser modules, and then uh, while the facility was being prepared, and then finally in uh, early 2021, we got the space, we started to move in. Uh, you see there's a, in, in February, there was still an empty um, box. And by July, we got this cold atoms. So it's, uh, you see a picture of those, each individual yellow dot is a single atom in an array. And this is roughly how it looks inside that uh, QPU. All right, so then how does it work on a high level from a customer perspective? So let's say we have a, a person who wants to uh, simulate some material science, like we've, we heard today um, a talk about crystal growth, right? What if you could um, simulate in a quantum computer some of those materials and crystals before even growing them to know if it's worth even trying experimentally? So let's say they have this problem. Uh, they write some Python code uh, to map their problem onto the quantum circuit that looks roughly like that that you see at the top. Uh, and then they would authenticate with our cloud, execute the circuit on our machine uh, from their perspective. Uh, at our end, at the back of the, um, at the back end, we would uh, convert their circuit into the native language of our physics, what's happening for the process called transpilation. And then our software would uh, then make a control sequence when and how you need to turn each laser on and off and on uh, to execute the circuit. And then once you've done all of that, uh, take a picture of those atoms to determine their quantum states, uh, get those counts uh, of uh, 
different quantum states that uh, this circuit is producing, ship result to the customer and profit. So that's on a very high level uh, how it looks from the um, outside. And I'm going to teach you today what is this happening uh, at the core of it, how to actually make a quantum computer in case uh, you need to make your own startup here. So uh, specifically for the neutral atoms approach, uh, this is the building blocks. Uh, you need to get uh, qubits. So we uh, use ultra cold atoms. So we laser cool atoms first from room temperature. They're flying around in the, in the, in the vacuum cell at the speed of a jet airplane. And then as soon as they get into, la into the laser field, they slow it down to a crawl of a snail uh, to about 100 microkelvin temperature. That's 100 microkelvin above the absolute zero. Then we trap them in the optical grid uh, to make the array cool down even further to about four microkelvins. Now that we're about uh, one million times cooler than outer space. And then there will be some manipulation there to move the atoms around, which I'm gonna talk about. So essentially we're just assembled from vacuum from scratch, uh, a computer chip, a, a quantum computer chip. Once uh, we, we have those atoms, we can prepare them in a uh, specific quantum states to turn them into qubits. Uh, then we apply uh, different gates to manipulate the quantum states of each qubit, is it individually or globally or uh, between the two qubits. And once we have all of the ingredients and we can uh, determine then what's the states they are by taking pictures, then we have a universal quantum computer. So now I'm gonna go into each of this line and tell you about the physics in uh, more de detail and how it looks in reality. Okay, so the first step, as you can see, it will be on top of this uh, line from that list. So you uh, see where you are in this process. Okay, the first step you need to laser cool atoms. And you know, if you're not familiar with laser cooling, it's an awesome thing to get the Nobel Prize um, three or four decades ago now. Uh, lasers can can just heat things. They can also uh, cool things. And th the way it works, if you carefully arrange your laser light field so it can scatter lots of photons in the right um, way, then you can slow down an atom. And that's basically what's happening. It's essentially, the analogy is that if you have a, a train is an atom. If you shoot a bunch of pinballs at it, uh, then it eventually you'll slow it down. Uh, and when I was a grad student, just like many of you, I had to build all of this from scratch. Uh, now you can just buy it. So cold quant is one of the um, quantum revolution parts is building this infrastructure, all those uh, tools so that you don't need to reinvent the wheel, just buy it. So for example, you can buy this uh, product called PICAS. It's on the left, it's a photonically integrated cold atom source. And you just stick in a couple of fibers, it slides in on the, on the vacuum cell and suddenly you have a, uh, a cold atomic beam at about um, 100 micro Kelvin type of temperatures. Uh, and then in this vacuum cell, this atomic beam is going then uh, up into a different cell that you see on the right. And that's we have this uh, six different uh, laser beams intersecting in the middle. And that's where the, the next phase of laser cooling happens. Uh, in, including trapping. So one thing you need to learn from uh, this talk is this important abbreviation MOT, magnetoptical trap. If you hear MOT, that's what it means. Uh, if you also arrange, if you add the magnetic pool gradients, you can arrange such that in the middle of the, uh, the gradient where the magnetic field is zero, there will be almost no light pressure from the laser beams. But if the atoms start moving away from the center, there'll be more light pressure from the laser beams and that will be uh, forced to go back. So, uh, this is how it looks in reality. This is a video from uh, our tuning where we just got this uh, working. What you see is a live video from that vacuum cell and that white cloud that is moving around, that's the gas of cesium atoms at about 100 micro Kelvin temperature. And they're moving around because I think either we're waving a screwdriver there by changing the magnetic fields and, and changing where the zero magnetic field is, uh, or we're tapping on the laser um, beam fiber couplers to change the interference pattern of the uh, 
of those laser cooling uh, fields. So once we got that cloud of atoms um, there, uh, then we turn this uh, optical trap. And the way we generate it, we start with a high power laser uh, that is then uh, going to the optical element to, to make a line that you see in the picture. Then that one line goes into the a device called the post optical reflector. We send a bunch of radio frequency tones and uh, we make a bunch of lines. So we have a few lines that we have an equivalent system for the orthogonal lines intersect. And, and you see this uh, process here. And just another better picture of how it looks. And then once we overlap this optical cage, uh, trap or, or lattice or array with the cold atoms, then they tend to be going into the dark spots because this uh, light is, uh, uh, has a photons higher energy than the transition of an atom. So the atoms are, are repelled by light, kind of the, the walls. And once um, you've done it, then you can localize those atoms into each of those cells. And I'm gonna show you a little demonstration um, how we do it. Um, also showing our backend tools, how we control all of the apparatus that we build remotely through the uh, a bunch of command line interfaces. Uh, so what you'll see is uh, how we initiate the sequence that I just described and then uh, show in, in real time how these atoms are trapped and forming those images. There you go. Uh, so now you see here the second and third pictures, those are the real-time images and each dot there is individual single atom that is trapped by these walls of light uh, and then each frame that you saw we've been blowing out those atoms doing this laser cooling again reloading them and that's what you see the, the pattern is changing uh, so the pattern is changing because uh, when you have a bunch of these atoms from the cloud um, sometimes in one of these cells uh, you'll have either zero atoms or one or two, let's say. Uh, if you have two atoms, they will start uh, colliding with each other with assistance of light and then will be not trapped and they'll, and they'll uh, drop out. So that's why we end up with about 50% probability that in each uh, cell there will be an atom, uh, which is not good for our uh, quantum computer. So we need to fix the holes. And the way we fix the holes is... Uh, by using an, another laser to just literally move the atoms around. So we use this optical tweezer of effect um, that also got another, another Nobel Prize and we, li we literally move the atoms. So we basically take a picture, you see, okay, the atoms are here and here, but not here. So we need to command our, our beam pointing system to shine the light in this cell where there is an atom and then uh, start moving it to another place. So we can fill the gaps and create beautiful arrays of no defects in the lattice. So um, I think this is very cool because we're essentially creating a chip one uh, atom at a time sort of thing. And then they're very cold and now we can start uh, turning them into the qubits. So to turn them into qubits, we need to uh, start thinking about the two quantum states we're gonna encode inform quantum information in. Question. Okay, so there is a question uh, about this optical tweezer. I still didn't forget the question. The asking is, where to where do we move atoms? Right. Yeah. Oh, I see. So in this case, it's a few microns, so between two and five microns that we can uh, change. No, uh, we generate it um, using a more controllable system. So if you can see, we start with this one line, right? And then this one line goes to the device acoustic optical deflector that can, if, that can deflect 
light if you send a certain radio frequency signal that will convert it to acoustic wave. So if we send, let's say, two acoustic waves, there are two different frequencies, then each of them will deflect the light into two different uh, spatial modes, and that will define the spacing. So by, by changing the radio frequency tone, uh, we can move those lines and change the spacing. That's why we can, can submit a different JSON and create two micron spacing array, or submit a different one, it will be a three micron spacing array uh, through all this software defined radios to generate the RF signal goes to this acoustic optical deflector. Yeah, good. Sure. Right, and then so we'll up is, will be, we have lots of sites, let's say it's 16 by 16, so we have 256 sites, and then half of them will be loaded, we have 128 atoms, but they're just all over the place. And then we use the um, optical tweezer to consolidate the atoms into a smaller subarray, but no defects. All right. Great. So, quantum states. We need to um, define what's our logical zero and logical one. In this case, we use uh, the same quantum states as we used to define our unit of time, second. Uh, so, in cesium atom, in the hyperfine uh, splitting, there is this m equals zero. Zeeman sublevels, and uh, the whole world is synchronized to that uh, energy difference between those two states. And that's exactly the two states that we use because that's a, a very convenient and mature technology with great coherence and all of the other uh, aspects of it. There is one um, problem though that when we load those atoms, uh, they are not exactly in M equal zero states. So there is this additional stage we need to do what's called optical pumping. Uh, so the M equal zero state is essentially a projection of a uh, spin on the quantization axis. So we need to be uh, in, in one specific one. And it's pretty easy to do to pump all of the atoms from any M states into the M equal zero that we want. Uh, if you shine another laser in these cases we use 895 nanometers and if its polarization is just right uh, from the selection rule of the excitation of atoms there will be allowed dipole transitions from uh, let's say m equals one to one m equals two to two and so forth but not from m equals zero to zero so it means that uh, if we excite atoms to any of the excited states, then they can decay down and eventually they'll go to M equals zero state, but no laser light can excite them from M equals zero. So they just end up to be in M equals zero. So, and there we go, we've created, we, need, we can initialize our um, atom or qubit into the specific quantum state. So let's say we pumped them in F equals four, M equals zero, and uh, we have a qubit. And also here we uh, use the same at, uh, atomic clocks technology of uh, using microwaves to change the state between this uh, F equals four M equals zero and F equals three M equals zero quantum states uh, by uh, turning on this 9.2 gigahertz microwave field. So we literally have a horn that sends the microwave just like in your microwave oven is 2.4 gigahertz in our case is 9.2, and then we can flip all the qubits from state zero to state one and, and vice versa. And we call it GR gate, the, the global rotation gate. Uh, okay, so the next thing, moving on to the list of the building blocks, uh, we also need to have um, a local single qubit gate so that you can say, okay, I have this uh, 100 qubits here and I want to change the state only that one, qubit number 56. So the way we do it, we, we have another laser. In this case, it's nice blue color for 59 nanometers. So we focus that laser beam to very, very tight spots so we can only illuminate one atom, but not others. And then we use this phenomenon called differential light shift, uh, which comes from the light shift. Essentially, it's the same me mechanism in physics what works in optical tweezer. If you shine a, a laser light on an atom, you will start perturbing its uh, 
energy states essentially start accumulating additional phase. Uh, so if we illuminate one atom with a 450 nanometer light, then it will have slightly different effect on, uh, on the zero or one state. And then you can uh, measure it, how much it actually uh, changes the phase of that uh, state, and then calibrate it. And then if you want to do any arbitrary phase uh, written to that qubit, you just turn the, that light on for a specific duration of time uh, that you've calculated. And that's it. That's, that's pretty easy. OK. And now moving on to the hardest one is the two qubit gate. In this case, we use the control Z rotation. And this is where the fun stuff happens. And probably the most challenging aspect of the whole uh, quantum computer or neutral atoms. So what is a control Z gate? Uh, it's a gate that um, would change the, roughly speaking, the quantum state of your target qubit depending on the quantum state of the control qubit. Uh, and then similarly to the classical computing, you have your not gate, that is this single bit gate, and you have and and or gates that operate on, on, on the two bits. Uh, and then if you have and or not, then you build the, the whole uh, classical computer. And similarly in quantum computing, if you have, let's say CZ gate and that R gate, uh, then you can build any quantum circuit. So this is the most fu fundamental piece is how do you uh, change the quantum state of one atom depending on the quantum state of, of its neighboring atom. And this is where the Rydberg interaction come in. And that's the one I mentioned where they have the trillion times on and off switch between the interaction. Uh, so this is how it goes. If the atom is in the, its ground state, there's zero one, then their atoms are very small. You know, they have this valence electron very close to the nucleus, and it doesn't interact much with anything, especially if it's in its m equals zero state. There is no, uh, well, there's very little magnetic field sensitivity and, and so forth. Uh, but if you excite this atom into a very high state where the, this valence electron moved from a very small orbit to a, a very large orbit so the atom became huge that's what we call the Rydberg atom is when you put this electron to a very uh, high orbit that became, that, that's the Rydberg atom and when it's in that state there is a huge dipole moment associated uh, with that so that if you have two huge atoms nearby with dipole moments they start interacting as dipole dipole and that's a very strong interaction that's uh, I think similar uh, interaction that you have in, in some chemistry in the DNA hydrogen bonds, like it's, uh, it, it's pretty big. So what happens is that once you have um, atoms in this high states, they start interacting and they start shifting its energy levels. And there's specific uh, term you need to know here, it's Rydberg blockade, uh, a phenomenon that um, uh, it, it literally, uh, blocks excitation of one atom to the Rydberg state if another atom is already excited in the Rydberg state. That's where the name comes in. So basically, if you have only one atom and you shoot a couple of lasers, in this case, it's a two photon transition, 459 nanometers and 1040 to go there. If you have only one atom, you shine a couple of laser pulses and, you, and this atom goes to this high level Rydberg state, okay? But if you, let's say, have two atoms and you have excited one of them and then brought another atom and you want to excite that one with the same laser pulses, it's not going to happen because that first atom has shifted the energy levels of that second atom during the dipole-dipole interaction. And then you're just off resonance. There's no direction. That's where the um, term blockade come in. And then you can do very clever schemes here is how to uh, use that phenomenon to manipulate the phases of these two qubits to do exactly what you want to create this uh, CZ gate. I'm going to go over it and it's um, 
not as trivial, so don't worry if you get it on the first time. But if you want to really understand it, then go to this paper um, from Michel Lukens' group in the PRL. So th this is how it goes. So let's see. If um, we denote, um, let's say, left and right atom in this uh, notation here, you'll see the cursor, right? Yes, great. Uh, so zero, zero is in this state, both of them. Zero, one is, uh, one atom is in zero, another one at one, and so forth, and then one, one is the both there. So the goal for this CZ gate is that only if, let's say, um, both of them are in uh, one state, then you flip the phase of, of both of them. And that's gonna be the, the controlled phase rotation. So how, how do you do it? So if you have both of them in zero, zero, then you shine these two pulses and nothing's gonna happen. So that's good. Okay, this is what denoted here. There is no phase accumulation then you can arrange if you have only one of them uh, in the state one that's gonna be resonant with the lasers, then you, will, you can arrange it so you accumulate a certain phase. And then if both of them are in the state one, one, uh, in state one then there'll be a different type of interaction that will uh, write another phase. So how do we engineer that? So this was the clever scheme. So you have a sequence like this of two uh, Rydberg pulses excitations. So here is one and two. And the trick is that you change the optical phase C here between them. So then uh, here what it does. So if you are in uh, the situation where only one atom is in this resonant state, then on the block sphere, it will go through one trajectory here and accumulate a certain phase, which is the area under this. And um, I wanna make sure everybody understands what this picture, everybody is familiar with the block sphere representation of a, of a qubit? If, uh, if yes, please raise your hand. Let's see. Okay, most of them, okay, great. Uh, so just quickly, if, um, as a refresh for somebody that doesn't know, so this block sphere is a, useful visualization of a two-level system like a qubit where um, the poles represent, uh, let's say, spin down, spin up, and the other angle is the phase between the two states. So in this case, we're starting from the state zero, one, where one atom is in state zero, so it's completely out of the picture, and another atom is in the state one, and it wants to go to the Rydberg state, uh, and then it starts this um, evolution. Once you turn the first pulse, it's starting to evolve and it almost wants to go to the top, but it's not going quite there because we also have detuned it by a very special detuning delta here. And then the first pulse got turned off and it ended up in, in this position there. Uh, and then once the second pulse turns in, because the optical phase was different, it's gonna rotate around a different axis and it's going to accumulate another phase and come back here. So it's always what we call returns to ground. That's important, otherwise we'll just lose them. And our quantum computer wouldn't work very well. Uh, and then it accumulated the phase that is uh, represented by this evolution, this shaded area uh, on this block sphere. Okay, great. And then here's what the important, magic comes in because there is interaction between two atoms is that if both of them are interacting with lasers, then they are both not going to the Rydberg state because in the Rydberg blockade, blockade regime, uh, it, they're actually be going to a superposition state where one of them is in the still state one and, and another one got to the Rydberg state or the other one, because we can distinguish between them. So this state in the Rydberg blockade is different, and that's the key to have a different phase written in that situation. And in that case, we tune things such that on the first pulse here, uh, this both atoms, they uh, do this first loop and come back. And on the second pulse, they, also, they do uh, another loop at a different angle because we change optical phase and come back. 
and the shaded region here is different from the previous one and that's what we want so then once we uh, figured out what phases were actually written we can always use already existing uh, single qubit gates to change those phases in whatever we want to make the perfect canonical cz gate with ones on the diagonal except the other one which is minus one and uh, we're good so that's how this uh, cz gate works so in, in summary to make the controlled rotation so that the phase written to the two atoms depends on whether they're both in the same state or not we use this rubric interaction and arranged it in a clever way such that they accumulate different phases so that, that's the gist of it okay and uh, once you've done that you have all, all the building blocks so let's recap here there you go so we, we've got our qubits we did it by laser cooling atoms in our case cesium from room temperature to four about four micro kelvin uh, we used optical tweezer to make a defect free array and we encoded the uh, quantum information into specific states and we're able to initialize the atoms into that specific state but using optical pumping then we can change the phase of those qubits globally for all of them by putting them in the microwave oven and we can change the phase of each individual atom by shining one laser beam that will uh, write the phase to only one atom and if we shine the those lasers to get to the excited state of the rubric state um, on, on two specific atoms then we can create this this is a gate uh, and then we already figured out how to uh, actually let's talk about this how do we do the readout it's easy it basically we shine a laser and if the atom is in state one it's gonna start with fluorescent so it's gonna be bright in the picture and if it was state zero it's gonna be dark so that so we if, once we take the picture whatever is bright is one uh, whatever is dark is zero and that's it that's uh, all the ingredients you, you need to uh, make universal quantum computer so now you can uh, go ahead and build it and we have been having lots of fun doing that so this is our team we've been building it for the past uh, few years and i want to advertise uh, that we're always hiring so if you look at our whole quantum careers website you can see there is this four divisions and then we have 25 open positions just in quantum confusion uh, and you can see there will be a bunch of physicists engineers and internships available uh, there's a lot of uh, engineering goes into building a quantum computer it's mostly 90 percent engineering nine percent physics and one percent of quantum information science uh, to get there okay uh, i want to do a quick time check do we have time uh, for the quantum cakes, Mister. Yes, we do. All right. I, I wanted to. Oh, there is a question. Great question. So the question was why we use blue tune trap versus the red tune trap, and. Uh, what actually means when AMO physicists say blue tuned, they mean is that the energy of a photon is higher than something so it's corresponding to the blue atoms of the visible spectrum or if it's ready tuned it means it's the low energy than atomic transition so it's correspond to the um, red side of the spectrum uh, and then the different configurations you can have if you have a blue detuned light uh, it will create this repulsive potential so the atoms will go into the dark spots and if you have ready tuned like an optical tweezer to go to the highest intensity point so the question is why we use blue instead of ready tuned and the reason is uh, we want them to be in a dark spot so that the those light sheets from the trap are um, small so if we have ready tuned traps the atoms will be trapped in their in their highest intensity points right and then the trap itself will introduce uh, light shifts that we don't want because they'll start sh shifting our 
qubit levels and we'll need to do extra calibration to take care of that uh, uh, the, the trap is not changing much because otherwise it screws up um, the, the phases and everything else. Okay, so the question is, why don't we use the magic wavelengths? So magic wavelengths is a such a wavelengths of the trap uh, where the differential light shift will be zero. And good question, let's see. Is it gonna work at it? For cesium, actually, I don't think there is a magic wavelength. I think for optical clocks, when you have two electron atom, you can find a magic wavelength. But for cesium, I don't think it actually exists. So I think that's the answer. There is no magic wavelength for cesium track. But if you find one, please let me know. <laughs> uh, in fact, yeah, uh, in, in my grad school, half of my PhD was long lived quantum memories, where exactly that problem exists that you need to trap atoms to create the memory, but then it destroys the coherence. And then uh, to, to create quasi magic trap, we would add even additional laser field to, to compensate. But I, th I, th I don't think there is a magic wavelength for a season trap. Which coin? How do we do polarization gradient cooling? Good question. So, um, as, as you saw in the slides, the initial cooling uh, gets us to about 100 microkelvin, which is what is limited by the Doppler uh, limit, uh, which is essentially the lifetime of the excited state that dictates how cold you can get. Uh, but we need to be about 25 times colder. So there is this additional technique called polarization gradient cooling, uh, also known as this Sisyphus cooling. And the way it works, if you have, let's say two laser beams counter propagating that will do the, the cooling and you arrange them uh, and their polarization in such a way that uh, on the scale on order of the wavelengths of the light, there will be uh, polarization oscillations, meaning that if, if an atom is here, it will observe, let's say, one polarization of light. If it travels a bit that way, it's gonna observe a different polarization of light. And because different polarizations, they couple differently to uh, the atom with the Klebsch Gordon coefficients, then it, it looks like from the atom perspective that it has a bunch of hills uh, that it dips. So that what, what happens is that the atom would climb up the little hill and then the laser light will excite and de-excite it and put it at the bottom of the hill. And it will have to climb again and do this again and again, just like the or Sisyphus had to um, put the rock on the top of the hill all over again. Uh, so that's the principle of the Sisyphus cooling. And we do that with some um, variations on the theme. And it works pretty well. We're able to get about um, four micro Kelvin temperatures in the trap. Okay, hopefully that answered the question. Yes. Ah, great question. Okay, we, we do PGC cooling in the trap. So the trap is already on and you do the PGC cooling. Yeah. Okay, any other questions before we move on? All right, so I was thinking uh, what kind of toy application can I give to show what we do on the, on the quantum computer and to tie it all together. And one of the thing I'm uh, excited about is uh, trying to understand quantum mechanics. You know that nobody really understands fully quantum mechanics 
we know it works, but we have no idea why or what it means, the bunch of interpretation of quantum mechanics. And if anybody tells you they understand it, they just don't really know quantum mechanics. Uh, all kinds of interpretations, the Copenhagen interpretation, the Everett interpretation. I would recommend uh, this TV show called Devs. They like go really in deep into that and it's quite fun TV show to watch. Uh, and in, in the center of the weirdness of quantum mechanics, why Einstein didn't believe in it, and hence the, this EPR paradox is uh, the quantum entanglement is weird, but it still kind of doesn't fully sink in how weird it is. So uh, how I learned this, the, I guess it's a standard way to learn is you have a source of two entangled photons. Let's say one is traveling um, to me, another one uh, to you, and then if each photon can be simultaneous, can be red or blue if you observe them, but you can prepare in the quantum superposition so that simultaneously red and blue, and also you can make them entangled such that uh, the two two photons are described by one wave function inseparable, such that even if one photon is on Earth, another one is on Mars detected, uh, if you observed one to be red on Earth, you know that it's going to be red on Mars. Like, okay, that's pretty weird. Um, and Einstein thought it was weird and didn't believe in it. But now we know it works. There has been products, quantum key distribution, all of that stuff. But it still really kind of doesn't fully uh, give full depth of the weirdness of quantum mechanics, which boils down to like, why do these quantum computers work in principle? Why do they give this exponential advantage? Are we essentially computing in multiple parallel universes and then ended up in the universe with an answer? Like all those questions uh, kind of boils down to this entitlement. So I uh, don't know, uh, had this talk at, at Cole Quanta uh, when I learned about this mystery of quantum cakes. And I thought, let's give it a shot to share with you and see if uh, it, it gets you also thinking. So think of it as a, a thought provoking exercise and you probably experienced what I first experienced that I didn't understand anything, mostly because I don't bake. Uh, I wish there would be a, a grilling quantum burgers analogy, but I, I didn't quite come up with one. Uh, but I wanna go over this and then uh, show how we could, let's say, use a, a real quantum computer to test this and, and, and play with this. Okay, so the, uh, um, thought experiments goes like this. You have this quantum cakes incorporated and it has this weird distribution channels of the two conveyor belts, okay. And they ship this, they produce the quantum cakes in pairs uh, in, and in ovens, it's kind of very complicated business here. Uh, but we have uh, Lucy on the left and Ricardo on the right. Uh, that's convenient for L and R. Uh, and then what they can do they can uh, do two types of measurements. So they can midway peak in the oven and see whether the cake has risen or not risen early. And this is where I lost my track. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you, if you need to bake a cake, you do some kind of a chemistry mixture, maybe with some yeast, you put this thing into the oven, something happens and it raises and then you take it out and eat it and it's, it's either good or not. Uh, so in this case, you can peak in the midway to see if uh, already at that point, if the cake has already risen or not. Like, okay, you can do that measurement. And also you can at the end, just taste it and see if it tastes good or bad. Okay. So then let's say this is a Google machine learning interview where they give you a bunch of training data and you need to come up with a model to, to do a predictive analytics type of thing. And let's say, uh, you're given this training data set that uh, observation number one. So when Lucy and Ricardo, they uh, open the ovens midway, uh, then at least 9% of the time, the both cakes rose early. Okay, check. Okay, let's incorporate that. Number two and three, uh, sorry, two into prime, whenever, let's say, Lucy's cakes are early, Ricardo's tasted good and vice versa. So it's kind of, you can say, well, this uh, raisin early feature 
is a good predictor that the cake will taste good, right? Because uh, we have these observations. And then now think if it's in a Google interview, uh, what would be your prediction on uh, probability that both cakes taste, taste good? I wanna let you think for a minute and uh, give some predictions like ballpark. Anyone want to sh share the, the predictions? What would you expect? Uh, what, what, what your model would uh, say? Okay, if you, if you don't show, just write down the number and uh, let's do another thinking here. Okay, what model can we build? Well, probably there is some correlation about the batter, right? Probably uh, if, uh, the both cakes are made with the same batter, then there will be some correlation between them. And they would say, well, if they both raise early 9% of the time, and this raise early thing is a predictor for taste good, we'll probably expect at least 9% of the cases, the both cakes taste good, right? This is what classical machine learning would tell you. And then, you can arrange it such that with quantum entanglement, they'll be never tasting good. And that's the weird stuff is that the quantum entanglement is completely different beast from the classical world that we live in, where the classical logic just completely fails. Like we're off by infinity here, <laughs> or uh, we expected at least 9%, but we can arrange it such that will be never tasting good at the same time. And with quantum mechanics, it's pretty easy to construct. Here is a quantum state here. Uh, there is just no good, good state, right? But if I uh, do this um, reason early, not early states here uh, in the different basis of good and bad, I could have totally reproduced that uh, results that were given as a training data. So it's um, very peculiar. And then I wanted to test it. Okay, I don't believe it, I'm, I'm gonna do it. Well, how would you test it on, on a quantum computer? Uh, you can encode, let's say, bad is state zero, good is state one, and then you would write a code to create a quantum circuit to prepare that state. Uh, so in this case, I used this Qiskit IBM um, stuff, and I asked my colleagues, okay, I have this quantum state, how do I, what quantum circuit will prepare it? I can't quite figure it out and say, oh, Qiskit actually has this initialize uh, function method rather, and you can just literally give those coefficients. So there is one half, is this one half? Oops, and then there is minus square root of three eighths, minus square root of three eighths uh, for these terms, and there is zero good good. So uh, if we just put zero, and then you run it, and you can visualize it, and this is the circuit that does it. It's like wow, that's not trivial. And then you can find that there was actually a high-profile science paper on just this initialized method because it's a non-trivial problem. How do you? Uh, write the quantum circuits to create an arbitrary initialized state. Uh, well, anyway, so um, here is there are two qubits. There is a, a rotation on a single qubit, rotation on a single qubit. This is um, got to be C naught here, looks asymmetric with CZ. And uh, so for that, here's the measurement. And then you run it on a quantum computer, which in, in, in the case, uh, in, in this day and age, is just uh, another few lines of Python code and you get the result. Those are the counts for different states and you end up see like there is no uh, state one one where both cases are good. All right, so hopefully that was uh, at least thought provoking and you'll come out here thinking about those quantum cakes and how weird quantum entanglement is. And now you know how to build a neutral atom quantum computer. So thank you for your attention and what questions you have.
Hello. Yes, thank you for the great talk. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, we have time for maybe for uh, one or two more two questions, if there are any from the audience. If not, I have a question. Um, you say that uh, to connect with you and that uh, you're always hiring. So what do you look for in a candidate, uh, someone who's coming in and looking uh, to work for you? Um, what's one of the important things that you look for, or a couple of the important things that you look for? As I wrote there, it's the solid science foundation, meaning that I think to me, physics is a good one so that uh, you understand the scientific method to begin with and the, the general physics type of thing. Uh, and then ability to, to learn fast. I think that's not a big one because we have to learn fast new stuff all the time. So that's basically part of the job. And as those two combined basically tell that you don't really need particularly specialized skills or knowledge. If you have a solid foundation and you can learn fast, it's gonna be covered. Uh, and related to that is problem solving, efficiently solving problems, uh, which usually comes with experience of solving problems. So if you had to, uh, had to build something that doesn't work and you need to troubleshoot to make it work, uh, that experience is usually the most valuable where you had to uh, take something from an unworking state to a working state that involves figuring it out from first principles of physics, engineering, all these block diagrams, the binary search for the problem that exists. Thank you. Uh, I think we have another question from the audience. So. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk today. And uh, my question is, I'm just curious of what step one of your process looks like, which is like, uh, how do you actually go about isolating an atom and putting it into your laser trap? Well, it starts with buying a ultra high vacuum chamber from called Quanta. <laughs> That's basically this step number one. Uh, if you do it from scratch, uh, if you make your own vacuum chamber, that's the first isolation happens. You need to create a vacuum. And usually like in grad school, you design it in the Autodesk Invent or something, buy a bunch of vacuum components uh, with those viewports and chambers, uh, pumps, and then you assemble it, you bake it at high temperature, and you create the uh, ultra high vacuum in that system. And then usually there is a process of breaking the like cesium ampule to introduce cesium metal into the system. So the atom starts flying around. And once you have that uh, ultra high vacuum system with cesium metal inside, in our case, cesium, and the vacuum level is, let's say, below 10 to minus 9, 10 to minus 10, 11 tor, uh, then the system is isolated already from uh, the atmosphere, right? Then you can already start shooting the lasers and create those cold atoms. Uh, the other isolation is uh, from different aspects of the environment, which is electromagnetic fields. And you do it from two ways. One is to make the system less susceptible to, to those fields to begin with. For example, by choosing those um, quantum states that don't move too much with magnetic field. And in some cases you would put magnetic shielding, special materials called mu metal uh, or any then Faraday cages uh, to shield from electromagnetic interference. Uh, and then the other thing you need to worry about is then electric fields as well, making sure that uh, there are no stray electric fields either from inside or from outside. And then once you've shielded from, from atmosphere, from electromagnetic fields, then the other things are the cosmic rays. But in, this, in our case, we're not susceptible to them because we we'll work with single atoms, which are very small compared to microscopic semiconductor, for example. Are there any more questions? Yes. Squeeze over there. So uh, I 
I don't have a deep understanding of the uh, neutral uh, atom traps, but I have heard that you know it's not the loading is not reliable initially. Uh, so is that so? Firstly, is that true that it's not you can't re very reliably load the grid that you want? And if, so, if you could talk a little bit about the reliability aspect. And my second follow-up question is when you know the fault tolerance arrives and you have to do millions when fault tolerance arrives and you have to do millions of i think it has already arrived for this kind of technology and you have to do millions of operations um, is that loading unreliability going to play a role in um, in the realization of fault tolerance how uh -huh. will it impact Good questions. So the first one is easy. Loading is very reliable in the sense that uh, with the, every single experimental sequence, you know, we always get 100 atoms, let's say, in, in a trap that is very reliable. Um, well, unless something breaks or there's a power cut, but I mean, it's a different story. And the second one is once you need lots of qubits for the whole to tolerant error um, quantum computer with other corrections, for example, then, uh, yeah, it becomes a, a, a bottleneck is how fast you can uh, supply new qubits. And uh, we're actually working on that. We have next generation systems where we have a separate system just for loading and a separate system for computation. And then there is a conveyor in the vacuum using the light traps to constantly supply atoms to the computational array. Other question? Very quick question related to that. So uh, what's the uh, time needed to load a 100 atom array and what are, what's the frequency of atom loss from your arrays if you have them? Sorry. Could so how the... long does it take to load, let's say, a 100 atom array? And um, how often do you lose atoms from the array during, uh, during like a circuit run? Uh -huh. It takes about on the order of 100 milliseconds. So you can do it roughly 10 times a second, you can load in, into the array. And losing happens in two ways. One is naturally because the vacuum is not ideal, but that's not a bottleneck. The lifetime is order of seconds or longer. The second um, way is uh, if we, during the gate operations uh, or our detection, then we either blow away atoms, but we don't want to, uh, or they go to some state and they're not trapped and they fall off. Uh, so that's uh, definitely a, a next generation thing to improve on the recycling of the atoms, basically, which is pretty straightforward on, on paper, and but requires lots of engineers to figure it out. It really depends on what you're doing. In our case right now, when we detect atoms, we just blow them away. So then we'll be blowing them away every second type of thing, or even more. Let's, uh, let's thank our speaker one more time. Our uh, next talk, titled um, Data Science and Machine Learning uh, Using NanoHub. It's given by uh, Juan Carlos uh, Verduzco, Verdu Verdu excuse me, and uh, uh, Zach McClure. I'll give a brief discussion, brief uh, introduction. Um, I would speak with... Uh, so um, Juan is a, is a PhD candidate at the University, at the University of Purdue um, in the School of Material Sciences. Um, he holds a BS in me uh, Mechatronics from Monterey Institute Technology and Higher Education in Mexico. His research is focused on coupling experimental techniques and physics-based simulations and machine learning algorithms for rational design of novel battery materials. Um, and then uh, Jack or Zach McClure is a, also a PhD candidate graduating this May um, at Purdue University. Uh, he's provided uh, lots of physics-based modeling and computational tools for developing materials uh, 
uh, in the engineering community. Uh, his specialties include data-driven design of innovative materials, data pipelines, management, machine learning with okay. small and large uh, data sets, high-performance computing resources, and cross-disciplinary uh, communication. And uh, with that, uh, yeah. they'll get the talk going quickly, yeah. and uh, and uh, we'll go from there. Just pocket with your mic. So I need to read everyone over there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's going second one. Okay, let's uh, let's start again. Uh, so once more, um, Juan and uh, Zach are going to talk about um, data science, machine learning, uh, utilizing the uh, Nano Hub tools. So thanks. Is there a second USB anywhere? Or just that's okay. We'll, we'll we'll just click away. No, no problem. Okay, um, can everybody hear us? Okay, I think we have mics and everything. Okay, awesome. So. Thank you again for uh, coming to this, this last talk. I see you guys have been here for a few days. So again, my name is Zachary McClure. This is my colleague, uh, Juan Carlos. So we're here in place of Alejandro Strachan. Uh, he is one of the deputy directors of NanoHub. So we are material specialists. So we work at a little bit of a scale just above quantum, um, but it's still kind of an exciting place to be in. And we hope that a lot of the tools that we use on NanoHub today, as well as techniques, things like machine learning and data science are fairly ubiquitous to things you might be interested in for your fields. So data science and machine learning, like I'm sure you're already probably well familiar with at this point, is learning from data by example. So we don't need rigid equations. We don't need some law that governs things. But these neural networks, these machine learning methods really tease things out. So things that have come out of a lot of these applications are your classics of Siri acting as your artificial voice intelligence, or AlphaZero that learned how to you know, play chess, actual games that have applications to them and not just solving the material property or a quantum state. So more increasingly in STEM fields, uh, especially in the area of quantum chemistry, material science, and biology, um, neural networks are really fascinating for a lot of people, and they're really advancing a lot of technology and design aspects to the aspect where we can actually sort of begin to uncover protein folding and biological mechanisms all the way down to those small electronic states that we're all very, very interested in. So with this kind of comes a question of any type of machine learning model that you've heard of relies on data. And you've probably all run into an issue at some point or another that there just isn't data out there or it's not accessible. It's not right there within your reach. So in 2016, there was this push uh, to make data more fair. And this fair initiative is uh, uh, principles 
that are sort of being pushed throughout a lot of different fields to create databases, open repositories, places for people to publish information of their own experiments, their own data sets, um, but also tools for educating the next generation workforce. So we at NanoHub work with a lot of these things for creating things like models, uh, in our case, supervised learning and unsupervised learning, rely on these data sets that we're now beginning to get a better understanding of as our cyber infrastructure grows. Okay, and with that, we're also gonna get into some kind of cool examples of how we use those databases for better experimental design. So FAIR in a nutshell is this idea of making data and computational resources findable, uh, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. So I know that a lot of you might be more interested in maybe the industrial field. So the, the first question you might be asking yourself is, well, you know, not everybody can have access to my data. Maybe it's proprietary. There, there's value in it. And, and it's not necessarily making your data available to everybody on, on a Google search. But if you're working at a company, you want to have a certain tier hierarchy of data that's available to workers, to CEOs, to executives, down to your uh, software engineers. You want to make sure that everybody's making good unified decisions together. Now, we also understand that a lot of times, us as graduate students, we do a lot of simulations. So we're computational people. And sometimes that data gets lost when somebody graduates. Uh, it stays on their laptop and it's nowhere to be found years from now. So we're really trying to make these pushes to create databases for people to access and actually be able to get something out of them instead of just one person. So again, these things that we're gonna go through for these acronyms, just to kind of get a flavor for it, this findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable is sort of a, a, a data philosophy, more than a, a rigid set of rules that we need to put all of our data out there, but a way to make data interfaces usable for everybody around us, colleagues, coworkers, and students. Okay, so one of the things that we're gonna do as an exercise, and we can verify real quick, did everybody receive like a pre-workshop instruction thing to get some API keys for a couple of tools on NanoHub. I see a couple nods. It's okay if you didn't do it. We're going to go through the tools together. But what we're going to do is go through one of these repositories that's really been helping us in this FAIR initiative uh, called the Materials Project. And so the Materials Project, what it is in a nutshell, is a density functional uh, theory database. Quick show of hands, how many of you have ever used or done DFT? Okay, so it's not completely foreign. So we're calculating electronic structures, calculating things like band gaps, dielectric properties, piezoelectric properties. And so you have a very familiar sort of GUI interface that you can go to and you can click through a few things and say, oh, well, maybe I wanna look at magnesium and oxygen paired together. And it's gonna give you a list of a bunch of different compounds some different energy states. And you can go through on this website and click through and it'll give you a nice crystal structure. It'll give you magnetic properties. Um, it's very informative and it's very intuitive, but it's, it's a little labor intensive. So it, it's something that's very nice to use. You can just go to the website at Materials Project to access these things. Um, but they went one step further. Uh, they decided that it was better to create a GUI, but also an application programming interface or an API uh, to access this database in a more robust fashion. So that's what we're going to do. So if you have your laptops and you want to join us in this demo, you can run this along with us. We're gonna to switch to one of the other screens and we're gonna to go to this tool on NanoHub uh, called Matt Data Repo. So another sort of question for the audience, how many of you, how many of you have ever used a GitHub repository? Sharing, pushing code, awesome. Almost everybody in the audience. How frustrating is it when you pull somebody's code and they say, I promise it works. How often does it actually work on your system? Occasionally, if you have good documentation, it might run and compile. If they have a good requirements readme, it's probably going to work. But there are still some steps and expertise that you have to sort of know and understand. So what we try to do at NanoHub is create tools that are online that we're going to go to a URL and access some work that we've done in the past of querying the materials project. So we've already run some of the demo ahead of time, just to save you some time and save us some time. But the basic idea of it is we're currently on NanoHub running from Cloud Computing Resources, uh, a live interactive Jupyter notebook. So this could be something that you would pull from somebody's Git repository, install it onto your computer and begin running. Uh, but we can run things now on the fly together. 
So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to kind of skip past most of these markdown cells, import basic Python libraries. And in this one cell, we can actually run it again just to kind of show you the, the speed of which what we're going to do. We're going to query the materials project for a bunch of oxides, things that oxygen atoms pair and bind with. And right now it detects that there are roughly 62,000 entries in the materials project that have oxide compounds, that somebody somewhere has done a DFT calculation of oxygen plus something and published it onto their database. And we're currently scraping that entire database for that information right now in, in a couple lines of code. And kind of like what was mentioned in the talk before this, uh, some very, very nice software engineers have built a lot of code under the hood for us. Uh, but right now we're gonna get those 60,000 entries and then we're gonna display them do a little bit of data parsing with them. Awesome. So now that that's complete, we're getting some information out of our, our database that looks like this. We have things like the stability of our elements and their energy above a convex hole. We have the task ID just for you know, keeping things sort of in one place. And we can convert this into something that's a little bit more two-dimensional, a little bit more user-friendly. We have these, these data frames that we can look at. Oh, oh, thank you. Sorry for the uh, online folks. So you didn't miss much. Um, we're just looking at a Jupyter notebook currently. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna filter through this notebook a little bit, and we're gonna skip most of the steps. You can obviously go back to this later. But what we want to look at are for a few sort of key properties of oxides, uh, the density of it, as well as the ionic packing fraction, or how well these things are sort of bonded together. So it's a bit blobular. We're obviously looking at 60,000 data points. Um, but you can see some of our like top oxides that you might be more familiar with. You have alumina, you have chromia over here in blue. I can't quite get it into one. Okay, so also we're using these interactive notebooks that are a little bit better than static plots, matplotlib. So you might be thinking of anything in your sort of field. These are going to be ways that you can interactively sort of disseminate some of the work that you're doing. Uh, we're going to filter through just a little bit to make a, a more feasible plot where we're actually now plotting two material properties. We filtered out some things that are a little bit unstable, metastable. And then we can also do things sort of quickly where we want to say, well, I don't want all these colors to just be black. I would maybe want something that's a little bit more colorful. So we can look at maybe the ionic packing fraction. And now you can look for different trends in your data, alter things on the fly. Now this tool is open to the public again, and anything that you might be interested in as well, uh, these tools and data can be published for whatever use you would like to do as well. Okay. Am I, am I still sharing the PowerPoint? Okay, we can do that. Cool. Okay, so that's one example of data that's out there, scraping data and getting it from some type of a repository. So at the end of the day, though, now that we have this data, what do we do with it? And that's where we're going to sort of turn to this idea of machine learning, this basic idea of linking inputs and outputs through some sort of complex architecture in the middle. Now, if we look at some of the most state-of-the-art architectures, they're incredibly complex. We have many different logic and gating functions, different activation sources, and these can be used to model full structures of eye disease. Uh, and this is sort of considered to be like the, the F1 formula racing car of neural networks and data science. We wanna look at something a little bit more simple. We wanna understand something that's kind of, you know, simpler linear regression techniques where we're taking these inputs and outputs and training some type of a model. So we can look at very simple functions, polynomials that are these physics-based models now that we have inputs as to give us better parameters and better understanding of that data that we're looking at. Okay, so these neural networks at the end of the day, if you've never seen one of them before, remember there's nothing scary about neural networks. They're just basic statistics. The only thing scary about neural networks is backpropagation. And luckily we're not doing any of that today. So at the end of the day, we have our inputs and outputs with some weights and biases that are attached to activation functions. And these are modeled off of our own biological systems and the neurons in our brains in the same way that we have inputs and outputs of electricity that create uh, activations. 
So again, these are just simple equations that we connect linearly with fully connected nodes to arrive to some type of an output parameter. These weights and biases are updated in what we call epochs. The operation of these neural networks is not as much of a lecture focus for today. We could do a full seminar on that if we wanted to, but we really just wanna kind of highlight that at the end of the day, when you have data and a deeper understanding of what's going on under the hood of your network, it becomes more accessible and you don't have to be an F1 formula racing driver you can be someone that drives a Prius and everybody can drive a Prius. So everybody can learn how to use a neural network. Okay, so now we're gonna get into a little bit of a different flavor of data acquisition. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at um, finding an oxide. Again, we're gonna start with our materials project database. And we wanna find some type of an oxide that has very high melting temperatures and a high, or, or a, a high ionic packing fraction to mitigate oxygen diffusion. So it's a lot of materials jargon that we don't really need to get into too much, but we need to figure out what's out there. So we can go to the materials project and I can get some information for the ionic packing fraction, the density of my oxides. Now, if I'm interested in the melting point, however, we found that the materials project, because it's a DFT database, it doesn't have melting point calculations. They're very expensive with that type of simulation. And you might run into this as well, where you want one type of property but it's a very high fidelity property. It's either very expensive to computationally calculate or incredibly uh, experimentally laborious to create. So something like the melting temperature is a little bit of a harder thing to really attach to. And there aren't very many, a lot of databases that publish the melting temperatures that aren't just in handbooks. So when was the last time that somebody used Wolfram Alpha to solve a differential equation or an integral or something? Yeah, it's. I used it to get through a lot of my math classes in undergrad, it's pretty cool. And then I ended up using Wolfram Alpha again in graduate school to get through my research because we found that like materials project, Wolfram Alpha has a pretty cool API to query melting points of things, kind of like a Google search. So we asked Wolfram Alpha, what are the melting points of a bunch of oxides out there? And as it turns out, really not a lot. There may be a couple of hundred data points that we were able to really start with. So when you think about machine learning, you need thousands and thousands of data points and you can't really just start with a hundred. Well, it didn't stop us from at least trying. So we asked ourselves the question of maybe the 11,000 oxides that I have, can I train some type of a machine learning model on my hundred data points and then predict for all of my compounds? And we could, um, but the model that we create from it is not super great. So in blue is our training and red is our testing. And as you can see, the error bars all over the place, there's a whole bunch of scatter. It's, it's really not a very good model. So then we started to get into this idea of, well, can we leverage other physics-based information? We know that the melting point is highly correlated to the stiffness of our atoms, how they interact and how they propagate their motion. So can we take some of that information and maybe build a model about these elastic constants that we then propagate into our melting temperature model. So as it turns out, if we use a model to help another model, we begin to improve that information even more. Then we're gonna go one step further. We're gonna use a model to create inputs that we're gonna put into a materials-based law, if you will, some of these governing physics-based equations. And then we're gonna add that as another feature into our melting point calculation. So now we have a model feeding into a model, feeding into a law, feeding into another model. And this is that idea of transfer learning. So these are using models in tandem to get information or features or inputs that you didn't have access to before. So now that we have a model that we feel we're a little bit more comfortable in, we can begin to extrapolate to that 11,000 oxide space. So we built a couple different models from a suite of different databases for the vacancy formation energy, the bulk modulus and the melting point. And now we can begin to explore sort of this blobular, very colorful space of the vacancy formation energy and the melting points. And we can start to figure out what's the new unexplored space. Where here in this middle column, we have all of our experimentally characterized oxides. But the most exciting is that we have these two question marks here, that these are finally oxides that have had density functional theory calculations on them and now a predicted melting point, but have yet to be characterized experimentally in that fashion. So that's the exciting thing about this leveraging of transfer learning is that you can use information from one database, one source to propagate through whatever information you're really trying to get to at the end. As long as you can build in those well-determined 
physics-based features and inputs to your neural network models that are generally agnostic. And that's kind of the beauty of it. And this tool is also available on NanoHub if you'd like to peruse and explore how the models were trained, as well as some of the visualization aspects. So that's not really the end of it either. This is just one example of supervised learning, where we trained a model and we actually did something with it. Uh, another very powerful technique in machine learning is unsupervised learning, where some algorithm decomposes something and gives us an answer that we, that we wanna look at. So one thing that we do a lot in our field are these uh, simulations called reactive molecular dynamics, uh, where we simulate CHNO molecules, breaking, bonding, reforming, and the actual chemical decomposition of this process is immensely complex. But what's powerful about these multi-body atomic techniques is we can actually track every single atom that's in that system and we can figure out all the molecules that form as an intermediate and go to products, et cetera. That's kind of hard for humans to wrap their brains around. And if you've ever had kind of an intro to chemistry or chemical rate reactions uh, class, there's usually some K1, K2 parameter and usually simplify things to products and reactants. And maybe there's some intermediate in between. So using super unsupervised learning, excuse me, we're actually able to do a dimensionality reduction technique to take these multi-body, multi-ordered component reactions and simplify it to a three-body reaction, products, intermediates, and reactants. And now we were able to then use these sort of segue reaction pathways to then scale up some of our calculations to a coarse grain model where we don't have to look at every single each in interatomic interaction. We can do it a little bit cheaper, but we know that we have that sort of physics based understanding going into an unsupervised technique. Now, there are lots of other applications of unsupervised learning, at, at unsupervised learning. We're giving one example of chemical decomposition and how that would affect your uh, process and how you can sort of calculate reaction rate kinetics at a different level. Um, but there are all sorts of other things that you can do with it. You can use unsupervised learning to detect credit card fraud. You can use it to detect if a customer is happy with their purchase or not. Um, everywhere ev that you look is when you use some type of unsupervised learning to characterize or categorize data that's coming in from a, a server or a database. Okay, so now that we have a bunch of data, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague who's going to talk to you about a little bit of the active learning loop that we do with experiments. Can you hear me? Okay. So, so in the in this presentation, uh, Zach explained supervised learning, which is relating inputs and outputs, and unsupervised learning, which is finding patterns. But in science and engineering fields, Data is really useful. Data is how we learn, how we validate our stuff, how we test our hypotheses. But data is also really expensive. No one is going to run the same experiment or have a grad student run the same experiment 10,000 times because it's really expensive. Nobody has the time. And the data at the end, it's, a, it's all about finding patterns. So active learning came about as a way to basically inform which experiments to run next. So if you don't want to run 10,000 experiments, can we run 50 experiments that are really useful for our model and learn something? So here I'm going to go uh, through the loop of active learning. So act active learning is a subset of machine learning that relates on how do we design experiments in the most efficient way. So we start with wanting to uh, have some discovery, learn a new law, optimize a property of a material, for example, a material. And we have existing data. We have some data, somebody tested in the lab, let's say 10, 20 points. What would be uh, the next point that we need to test if we wanna test some hypothesis, if we wanna optimize a property like maximize, for example, ionic conductivity, which is the, ex the example that I'm gonna be talking about. So you start with some existing data and something like what Zach was discussing before is we can create models with all of that data. So think neural networks, or there's another type of model called random forests that are um, based on decision trees. And you can create a predictive model. But creating a predictive model, a machine learning model with limited amount of data, it's all, you, you should always take it like a, with a grain of salt. It's, it's difficult to learn when you don't have a lot of examples to learn from. But you can still learn. You can still have your data, 
and create a model and predict for all of the other possible experiments that you want to run. And then with these models, instead of just using the model to say, here's my prediction, we should do what the prediction says, we can do, use it to screen a search space. So here in the predictive models here, you can also create a search space. Here's all of the new data for which I have no labels. I have no information of what the experiment is gonna be, but I know that experiment is possible. And I wanna know if the model can tell me if that is a good experiment. Here at the bottom of the loop, we also can make use of um, a set of really interesting functions, these information acquisition functions, which is basically the criteria that we use to choose which experiment is good. We can choose the experiment that maximizes a property, the experiment that makes the model less uncertain of their properties, for example, and then we can go and test it. So a really good, a really important part of the active learning loop is actually running the experiment. This is a loop. You don't see it because it's not finished, but this is a loop. So you start with some data, you screen or predict in a model that it's easier to evaluate neural network or random forest, so machine learning. You can use linear regression if necessary. You use a criterion to choose which experiment to run next, and then you go and run it. The experiment doesn't have to be you going to the lab and creating the material and characterizing. It could be it could be running a computational simulation like MD or DFT, like Zach and I do, and then just use that as the, the next point on, on your loop. So if you don't go into this arrow here where you found whatever you were looking for, you can always go into the loop again and say, okay, I ran the experiment. Now I have more data, another point with my existing data, put it into the model and loop again until you find some design criteria that you want to satisfy. So this active learning loop, active learning loop is really useful specifically for material science, but it should be useful for chemistry or biology because we want to minimize the number of experiments that we want to run. And because we have the data that we have is not easily accessible. So these functions that I was discussing uh, basically tell you which experiment to run next. And they have two kinds of flavors. You can use functions or criterions that are really good at exploration. So you wanna explore things that have not been explored before. And you can use them to explore things that are really close to, in this case, materials that are really good. So if you have a material, let's say one of the oxides that Zach was discussing, maybe you wanna look into materials that are really similar to that oxide, because that might be the, the way to maximize this uh, property that you're looking for. So if we draw uh, an arrow between exploitation, um, functions that deal with exploitation and functions that deal with exploration. In this example that I'm gonna present, we, we used five. The first one would be, for example, maximum mean, which is just the prediction. Whatever predicts to be highest, we're gonna test that one. On the other end of the spectrum, we have exploration. So for each point, you also get an uncertainty. Depends on your model that you're using to, to predict, but you usually get an, uh, some sort of uncertainty. Even in, a, in experiments, you can get uncertainty. You can test whatever point gets predicted to have the highest uncertainty. And in the middle, there's many more things that you can try, combinations of the mean of the predictions and the uncertainties in different ways. In the first one, the upper confidence, um, upper confidence bound method, it's just basically um, you have your prediction and you have your uncertainty. What's the highest point that you can get? Prediction plus the uncertainty. And then these other two are based on statistics on a Gaussian distribution of the functions around the mean with uh, standard deviation as the uncertainty. But basically the, the, the middle three are just combinations of exploitation and exploration that you can use in your active learning to screen for candidates and then test your next candidate. Another tool, so we went through Zach's Oxide tool. Another tool that we're gonna go through is an active learning tool where I'm gonna be going through a library uh, of queried from the literature points and trying to maximize ionic conductivity. And I think if I can go here. Okay. 
and you can still see the screen. So I'm gonna go all the way to the top. So this is another uh, tool that is available in Anhub if you wanna explore um, this experiment on active learning in which I'm trying to maximize a property called ionic conductivity, specifically lithium ionic conductivity in a type of ceramic garnet. So here you can see we have some um, markdowns and then we import some libraries. Here in, in SAC's example, we were querying a website called Materials Project, which is very useful, you should try it. Here we're querying a different um, database called Citrination. It's from Citrine Informatics, a startup. I think they're still considered a startup company in California that basically allows you to upload your data into their repositories and use their tools to explore your data. These two, this uh, database, I, I had to create it. There was no available database for that specific uh, application that I needed. So I went through 10 years of papers collecting point by point from one paper, three points from another paper, and came up with around 100 points for my uh, specific application on this oxide. And I put all of that information in this database and anyone can use it now. So it's available if anyone wants to do another Example with this oxide, they could do it. They could just need to query it from there. And here you can see that we get these formulas. You are probably familiar with some of the stoichiometry. That doesn't matter if the ceramic oxide is familiar to you, but you recognize these are some elements and the molar ratios between the elements. From this, we can go uh, around this uh, notebook and explain each line. I'm not going to do it in this seminar, but you're welcome to try. There's comments if you want to understand exactly what's happening. But one of the really important things that machine learning things, machine learning models specifically need is, imagine you have a material, it's some oxide. You need to use descriptors to tell the machine learning model, how is that oxide different from a similar oxide? So for example, manganese oxide and nickel oxide, how are they different? So there's, literature on how you can featureize um, compositions, but the, the choice on how to do it is entirely up to the de developers at this point. Here we're using um, a paper from 2019 that deal, dealt with inorganic ceramics to featureize it, and we put things that are based specifically on the composition. Then we go and remove duplicates. We all had a lot of duplicates, but still at the end, so at the beginning, we had around 189 points. And then after removing duplicates, it's about 100. You can see here, there's 100 after the features. Then we do some processing, like separating between training and testing. And we can start getting some um, results of our machine learning models really quickly. So for a neural network, it's just a couple of lines of code, maybe 10, and then training it. And you already see uh, the training and the validation errors going down. And you can get a parity plot that it's not going to fit here, but you can see how the data and the testing data are distributed, where things on the line are accurately predicted, and things outside of the line, you, 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 you can understand the parity plot. You can also use something else like a random forest, also just a couple of lines, because this is all uh, plotting. And you can see that it's a significantly better model. It's closer to the line. There's not that many outliers. We also use uh, specific um, libraries that with a random forest will also allow you to get bars. You, you would get uncertainty bars on your testing data and you can start using this to basically gauge how accurate your model is with the features that you chose. But this is all just machine learning. Active learning is what I was discussing before this loop. And here we have all of the explanations on active learning, what ac information acquisitions are and how they're um, define and here we have the code to run it in my example since i have 100 points i decided to start with 10 points just pick 10 points randomly and see how those can be used to screen the rest of the candidates since i'm not i don't have the resources to be running the experiments to synthesize and characterize the ceramic i'm basically just revealing which uh, uh, whichever candidate gets chosen, just revealing the, the ionic conductivity while hiding it for the from the model during training. So we choose 10 points and then we choose different acquisition functions. And in this loop, uh, it's the loop that we saw before. 
you start with some training, you make some predictions. So you start with some training, then you make some predictions, then you use one of the acquisition functions to select the candidate, and then you go and test it. Here, testing is just revealing the, the ionic conductivity again. And here we, we get something very interesting at the end. So here, this is a video, we can track with each of these candidate functions, which of the points in our search space was explored. Here you can see we have different, um, we have colored the points that were explored. Here we, blue, red, and yellow are the ones, are the functions that combine exploration and exploitation. And that was one of the main results of the paper that if you go all the way exploitation, only explore things that are really similar to the things that you know are good, you get there eventually, but you don't get there fast enough. And by using things that com combine exploration and exploitation, you can get there faster. So let me go back to the PowerPoint here. So this is what we were seeing, all of the, the querying of the databases, the markdowns for explanations. And here's what I was explaining. We start with 10 points and then you train a machine learning model and evaluate on all of the possible experiments. And you use the functions to decide which experiment to reveal next. And here is a, a kind of a cool example on like for an audience question. Imagine we had that plot over there, this plot at the bottom. And you have these marked plots. I mean, these marked points. There's a green uh, square here, a red circle, and then like a diamond. Choosing which experiment to run next, it's entirely up to the developer. So just for the audience, can you raise your hand if you would pick, these are all predictions, if you would pick this point with the highest uncertainty, if you wanted to maximize, in this case, strength, would, would you choose this uh, diamond? Now, who, who would choose the square, green square? And who would choose the red uh, circle? Okay, so either the square or the circle are good ideas. So square, it, it would be representing the maximum mean, which is just the highest prediction. We take that and we run that experiment. The maximum, this is another of the combinations of exploration and exploitation. You would get something close to where the maximum is. And if you just add up the uncertainty, it's higher than what you already have. So those two would be good functions. Then maximum uncertainty, it's also interesting, not when you're trying to maximize a property, but when you're trying to minimize uncertainty of the model. If the model knows about, knows more about some of the points, it might be, it might bring the uncertainty of all of the points down, making it more accurate to make predictions. And then if you don't find the, the candidate that you were looking for, in this case, we already knew what the candidate was. So we're just testing the efficiency of the methods of getting to that candidate. But in the real world, you don't know what the best candidate is. Finding a, a really good material for something, it's something that you do in grad school and every professor wants you to find the material that's gonna change the world. And you don't know what, what that is, but active learning could be a good idea on how to start to screen which experiments to run. And here is a, one of the main results of, this also became a publication where we track how many experiments it would take us to find the maximum ionic conductivity in our pre-compiled data set. Here in each of these uh, panels, you see a different acquisition function and you see how it was explored. In the, in the tool that we saw, it was just colored if it was explored. Here it's a gradient where if the color is more intense, it's, it's, it kind of represents the order that it was explored in. But here in the first plot, you can see that the maximum ionic conductivity as we move out in experiments always happens with the ones that combine both exploitation and exploration. Here, this green one is just randomly choosing. So if we had a hundred experiments, you would think maybe around 50, you would have a good chance of finding the better one. It was a little over 50. But the main point of active learning is something like this. So when I was explaining um, the active learning loop, I said, we just chose 10 random points out of the data set. But what if instead we chose the 10 oldest points in the data set? So imagine here in 2008, someone would have come up with this idea and they had 10 points and they had all of these experiments that they needed to run. 
if they only started with this, those 10 points and then use active learning, you will get the red arrow. You would get experiments that are already higher than what they would be um, if you hadn't used that as a way to inform your experiment. So each of these points represents an experiment that happened after the initial points. So imagine that if instead of this point, you run this one. This one is much worse. And instead of these two, you run these two. So it's, a, it's basically just swapping which experiment was run, but you can definitely see the trend where in this plot, we're trying to basically get to the green region. You would get to, we, we would already be, this is a real speculation, we would already be at the green region if we had used these things to explore the, to explore the possible experiments to run. So this is, this is pretty cool with active learning. And I think with this, I'm gonna hand it back to Zach. So yeah, so you know the the phrase of we should have started active learning, you know, back in 2008, it's there's a phrase of the the best time to plant a tree is 30 years ago, but the next best time is today. Um, so that's where we're going to kind of leave off on is with this idea of NanoHub, and NanoHub has been around for 15, 20 years now. So luckily we're on the 20 years ago, but we hope that we get to plant the seed today uh, for continued work and collaboration on NanoHub. So we like to think of NanoHub as a community. Um, it's a way for you to publish your data, to teach new generations of students, um, but also to share your work with other uh, researchers and students. So it's a combination of a lot of things. It's, it's scientific codes, Jupyter notebooks, data tools, repositories, and all of these have sort of different uses and operations that you can create um, for whatever sort of audience you're trying to look at. So we have uh, web applications and tools that make it very easy for first time users to sort of show up to the website. You could actually go to the website and run a density functional theory or molecular dynamics simulation right now. Uh, you just have to go to the link, download and, and run the simulation. We have machine learning workflows, as well as some new things that we're beginning to roll out where we have actually integrated uh, phone apps to upload your data to our repositories as well. So this is a way for us to create these open resources. Um, as of today, NanoHub has almost 700 applications and tools that have been published by the open community. Uh, these range all the way from undergraduates in their classrooms to professional researchers that are using these tools actively in their research, like uh, Juan Carlos and myself, as well as trying to teach uh, students and, and at the university and beyond. So we have over 1,800 contributors. And as you can see, since its kind of inception in 2000, NanoHub is continuing to grow. Um, so we're, we're very happy to see that people continue to be interested in this, um, especially as we sort of lower some of those energy barriers, if you will, for new people and fresh faces getting into the, to the community. There, there's another idea that we definitely like to push out there is the, the community of scholars. You know, if, if everybody in the community can contribute something to science, uh, we get to gain a lot from that perspective. Also, one thing that we like to highlight is that, you know, dissimilar from the GitHub repositories we mentioned earlier, uh, these simulations can actively run on cloud computing resources. So you can open this up on your laptop. You don't need super fancy computing hardware to run this, you just need a URL. Okay, in addition to the tools and simulations, um, there are also a number of avenues for educators uh, to provide tools or students to access workshops and hands-on learning activities. So we have some sort of different levels uh, for people. So if you've never used data science before, if you don't know what Python is, you can kind of go over here to the left and we'll teach you a little bit about what basic coding is. And then we'll immediately throw you into the deep end and we'll make you do some unsupervised regression on, on dimensionality reduction for chemical components. Um, we continue to have updating uh, workshops and hands-on demos for people to come in. Um, these newsletters go out pretty frequently for you know, debugging neural networks, um, different types of Bayesian optimization for materials discovery and more. So a lot of these are also incorporated in undergraduate classes for a whole sort of suite of tools and uh, techniques. So we kind of hope that obviously this is a, a quantum school seminar, but we hope that you know some of these ideas are very Pythonic based. Uh, these are very code based. And if you feel that there's a tool that is of value that you'd like to contribute to the community, um, we'd really be happy to have you on the platform. So the way to do this is pretty streamlined. We have a couple of tutorials on how you can create a tool, how you create that unique URL for yourself, 
Um, but one of the biggest aspects of this is this isn't just a, a, a website that you kind of push out there. Um, this gets indexed by Web of Science, and it actually has a unique DOI whenever you publish something. So if you put this work out there, people can cite it. It, it is open. Uh, there will be a, a proper citation for it in a paper, a URL linking you there, so that your work is incorporated into everybody else's, and it doesn't just you know, sit there in some kind of repository. So that, again, brings us back to that idea of FAIR for our data, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. We want to build things for people that they can use, and we hope that you, know, you all find some interest in that as well. So with that, um, you know, kind of wrap up and just say that, you know, again, while we weren't a quantum talk, it's a, it's a data science talk. And quant the quantum world is very data heavy, uh, both in the hardware and software sides of things. So we hope that both supervised and unsupervised learning are going to provide some cool insights to overcome your future challenges. Um, and with that, we'd also like to kind of leave you with that data philosophy idea of creating tools for everybody, uh, and maybe not everybody if it's proprietary, but you know you want to create something that's easily accessible for the person that's funding your project, whether it's your advisor, your boss, your CEO, um, or whoever you meet in the future. So thank you, and we'll take any questions. I know we got done a little early, so we have plenty of time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the, the talk and for the um, uh, very useful information. I think it's could be it's uh, something that's really useful for most of the graduate students and uh, and uh, scientists here. Um, yeah, I guess uh, we'll start with some of the questions in the Zoom chat. Um, so yes, yeah, so this first one would be related to PCA. There are some other dimensional reduction things that involve. Uh... Your ones earlier. Okay. Uh, yep, yep, please share the screen. What machine, machine learning models are supported by NanoHub? So really, any, most anything that's uh, implemented in like modern Python uh, is implemented. We also do have some for MATLAB. Mm -hmm. um, the nice thing, though, with NanoHub is that we're uh, a small enough community that there's a dedicated ticket support system. And people will actually get back to you in response. So if you're like, hey, I kind of want this you know, library installed, they'll, they'll install it for you. And that's kind of a nice aspect of it as well, that you know, installing and debugging is always a challenge. And there, there's a dedicated team that can help you do that. Um, any usage of NanoHub for finding best material for qubits? I think so. I mean, there's a, there's a huge ECE push there on, on NanoHub. ECE push. I, don't, I can't recall a specific tool looking for materials for qubits, but it would be very useful. Yes. So. If there isn't one, we'd like one. <laughs> um, and there, there might be something that's in that kind of same vein. Okay, I guess uh, those are all the questions from Zoom chat. Are there any questions uh, in the audience? Um, I do have a question. So this seems really useful, especially being able to put your data on, on a, a platform and then, uh, and, and then use it for some sort of machine learning. But one of the problems that you even touched on was that you had to go through all these papers and you had to look in each one and put them onto your onto you know into build your own data set, um, which is tedious because people put their uh, data in different formats and so on and so forth. Uh, so what are there tools that I mean the best tool then to me would be that you would find a tool that would search papers and grab data and then put it into a data set. What's uh, your thoughts on this and are there ideas like APIs that would do this sort of uh, part of the task? Yeah, so th there are actually some really good libraries for PDF and web scraping. Um, and so with some journals, uh, so the first limitation would be getting access to journals. Uh, that's always a fun one of, you know, you have to pay for the journal, you have to have a license, et cetera. So if you had that journal database, let's say, you could have a PDF scraper that would, that would go through and there are some libraries you could write for that. Um, and you could have NanoHub access that database of papers, scrape through it, and then push it to your other outputs. Um, something that we didn't cover in today's talk that is something that we're trying to push that I think is kind of a good segue for what you just brought up is this, um, this library that we built called a SIM tool. And it, it flows on that idea of well-defined inputs and outputs for machine learning models. And so you could build some SIM tool that scrapes a whole bunch of data. And then what it is essentially is a cache of all those outputs that you save. So it's going to take a lot of time 
to go through all that data and, and scrape through it. And so you're going to then save that somewhere in a cache. And then that can be used by someone else down the line. But there, but there isn't like a specific tool on NanoHub now for doing that sort of scraping. That's all on you. Not right now. Okay. Yep. Well, okay. So that's something for the future. So um, it, it, it's kind of a fun, like, um, it, it, it's a chicken before the egg scenario. And it's the same thing with active learning. You know, everybody says, we need a bunch of data to build this machine learning model. And then they go, well, there's no, there's no data out there. He says, well, let's go, let's go make some data. Well, I need a machine learning model to tell me which data to go find. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, the only other thing I would want to clarify, you don't have to be a Purdue student or Purdue affiliated to work with this. Absolutely not. Uh, signing up is super easy. You can sign up even if you just have like a Google account. You can create a NanoHub account, but it's access to everyone around the world. And when you publish something, um, you know, with this map, I kind of hope, hope elucidates is that anybody around the world can also access your tools um, if you want them to. I, I guess something we should clarify is that there are options on NanoHub to create closed tools. Um, if, you, if you don't want your information out there immediately, you can do that. There are also ways that you can completely remove your data from the NanoHub cloud. We have different docking containers. That's a more corporate thing, probably not for this audience, but yes, yeah, absolutely. Anybody can use it and anybody can access. If, are there any other questions? If not, let's uh, thank our speakers one more time. And I believe according to the schedule, uh, we have another break and we will reconvene at uh, 4.30. See you then. Cool. Hey all, uh, just a quick announcement since uh, we got done here a little early with this session, we'll just take about a 30 minute break from now and then start back our postdoc award seminars at four o'clock so they have a little bit more time. So uh, about 30 minutes from now, we'll start back up at four o'clock. <laughs>